Hey guys, what's going on? This is why I'm starting a new tutorial series on Java programming language. If you want to build apps for Android devices or desktop applications that run on Java runtime environment, you will need to know Java. I will start by showing you how to install Java Development Kit and how to get started with IntelliJ IDEA Community Editions. I will introduce you to the basics of programming language, including its data types, keywords, and best practices. I will show you how to control program flow using conditional, logical, and loops, and how to store data collections in memory with Java Collection Framework. Since Java is an object-oriented language, I will describe how it implements concepts like encapsulation, inheritance, and polyformism. So my goal of this the goal of this course is getting you started with Java programming language, so you can go out there and build a mobile application desktop applications or web or any other Java application. I'll be organizing this course in a playlist so make sure you check that out and I'll cover every single thing I know about Java. If you want to learn Java completely I would recommend do not skip any video, watch my video in a series so you get better understanding of Java programming language. If you haven't subscribed to my channel subscribe now and you can follow me on Twitter at awaysmeza01. If you have any question you can leave a comment below. And I'm always available on Twitter, so if you have any question regarding any of the tutorials, you're facing any problem, understanding what I'm teaching here, you can tweet me at awaysmeza01. Thanks for watching guys, and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Alright guys, welcome to the second part of the Java Central Training Series. So this video is about Java history. I'm going to give you a little bit of introduction about Java, who created Java, and what are the versions available in Java, right? So before we get into the video, I want to say subscribe to the channel to support me. And if you like this information, give this video a thumbs up. You can follow me on Twitter as well, at awaysmirza01. So that being said, let's get started. Java has a long history. It started in 1991 when Sun Microsystems began something called the Green Project. The goal was to create a new portable programming language that could create application and could run on multiple operating systems without having to be recompiled or ported. The original name of the language was Org. By the time the language was released, it was renamed Java, supposedly because of the amount of coffee that the developers were drinking. Java was first released to the public in 1995. The phrase, write once, run everywhere, was popularized. Again, the goal of Java was that would be able to write a program and would be able to compile it once and then run it on Unix, Solaris, Windows, Mac, and any other operating system for which there was a Java virtual machine available. In 1996, Sun released the first complete Java developer kit or JDK supporting a broad range of application development tasks. Version 1.1 the following year saw improvement to the object-oriented nature of Java. With inner classes and Java Beans, the JDBC API for talking to databases, RMI or remote method invocation for a distribution system, and reflection for improving the dynamic capabilities of the language. In 1998, Java was rebranded as Java 2 SC or Java 2 Standard Edition. The Standard Edition's moniker distinguished it from Enterprise Edition which was a framework for building large-scale web applications. The version number was Java 2, version 1.2, a little confusing, and the 2 after the J stuck around for many years, but the version were incremented using point numbers 1.1, 1.2, 1.3, and so on. Java 2 SC 1.2 included the Swing graphical API for building desktop application, the collection framework for managing multiple data elements, a new tool including just-in-time compiler and the browser-based Java plugins to standardize the version of Java across the web. A couple of years later, Java 2 SC 1.3 added new tool including the hotspot JVM, a new version of Java Virtual Machine, the sound API and improved debugging. In 2002, version 1.4 added new tool in the language. And then 2004, a major milestone, Java 2 SC 5.0 was released, now internally as Java 1.5. From this point forward, Java would be known as Java 5, Java 6, Java 7, Java 8, and so on. In terms of core language syntax, this was the last major change. 
Everything else has been incremental. Features that you could choose to choose or not to use depending on the kind of programming you were doing. In 2006, Java 6 appeared. It improved performance for database connectivity, improved graphical programming and added other small features to the language. From 2006 to 2010, Sun Microsystem released occasional maintenance releases and so you would have Java 6 maintenance release 10, 11, 12 and so on. But it took 4 years until a new major version came out and then in 2010 Oracle bought Sun Microsystem and all of its assets including the Java programming language Oracle Corporations now manages Java along with JCP, the Java community process, the Sun begins and after Oracle purchased Java. The pace of change increased again. In 2011, we got J2 SE7. It included significant new syntax changes. The most recent version as of time of this recording was released in 2016. Java SE8 implemented Lambda expressions, a new date and time API, and other syntax improvement and we are expecting another version of Java down the road. Java SE9 is currently planned for release in September 2016. According to the current plan, it will implement a modularization of the Java runtime libraries and at one point it included a plan for a new lightweight JSON API. But doubts come into question. We won't know for sure what's going to be in Java SE9 until about 6 months before its final release. But for now, Java SE8 is the most recent major version of Java for everything except Android development. For Android development, you will want to look into features of Java 6 and Java 7. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. If you like the information, make sure to subscribe and hit down that thumbs up button. And I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. guys welcome back to the third part of the java essential training series so this video is going to be about java syntax and compilation so i want to talk about these two major things in java programming so let's get started all java code is defined in classes each source code file defines at least one java class that has the file extension java you can create these text files in any text editor although i will be using intellij idea for most of this course the compiler Java C compiles your text based code into bytecode that can be interpreted by JVM and then Java command runs that code. Here's the classic hello world application. The name of the class is main, so it is defined in a text file name main.java. The file line is called package declaration. Java classes are typically organized in the packages. A package is globally unique string that typically starts with your domain name in deserved domain order. So my domain name is awaitsmirza.com. I would start my package string with com.awaitsmirza to ensure globally unique identifier. Then if there is more than one class named a main in any application, I can distinguish them using the package. And each source code file will contain one public class. The name of the class is main, that is identifier, and it implements a single method also named a main. Notice that the method identifier uses an initial lowercase letter. A console application always has this main method. It always has the three keyword public, static, and void. Public means that the method is available to entire application. Static means that this method can be called directly from the class definition rather than from an instance of the class. A void means that the method doesn't return any value. A required main method must also receive an array of strings as an argument or parameters. It must be an array of strings but the name doesn't necessarily have to be argument. You can name it anything you like. Finally, the executable code is placed within the main method. The code is printing the string hello world to the console and it ends with semicolon, which is like a period. It means that at the end of statement, here are some critical Java syntax rule. Java is case sensitive and all the identifiers must be unique within their scope. Because Java is case sensitive though these three identifiers or variable names are seen to be different from each other. First name in a lowercase, first name with a camel case and first name in all uppercase could represent three distinct variables or values. Also in Java white space doesn't affect how your code is interpreted. For example, in Visual Basic and some other application, a line feed means that end of the statement. 
In Java, a line feed is just like a space and a tab character. All three of those types of characters are collapsed during the compilation process into a single bit of white space. And it's also up to you to indicate where a statement ends with a semicolon character. The code, for example, says printing the string to the console and the semicolon character is required to end the statement. The Java language implements a whole set of keywords that you should learn about. Keywords like for, while, assets, and other can be used as your variable names. If you, if you try to do that, the compiler will reject them. Again, names of the classes, method, variables, and so on are known as identifiers. And all the identifiers must start with the alphabet character or an underscore character. So you can't use numbers, you can't use other special characters. Class name always start with an uppercase character. So my class start with an uppercase M, but then can use other uppercase character as needed to make code readable. Methods, variables, and other members of the class always start with a lowercase character. So that would be a method called a do something. It start with a lowercase t, and it receives an argument or parameters that start with a lowercase w. If you were to type these identifiers with uppercase character, your code will still work. Constants are always all uppercase letter. There is no constant keyword in Java. Instead, a constant is a static and final. Static means it, it's a member of a class and final meaning once it's been set. It cannot be changed. This is a string constant named first name. That has a value of David because it's a constant, first name in all uppercase character. There are some of the most critical syntax rules that you should know about you start to program with Java, but of course I will talk about many others as the course goes along. Hey guys, thanks for watching this video. If you like the information, make sure to subscribe and hit down that thumbs up button, and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Awais and I welcome you to the fourth part of our Java Essential Training Series. So in this video, I'm going to show you how to download Java Development Kit and set it up. So we're going to go to my desktop computer now. In this video, I'll be showing you how to download that in Windows. But the next video is coming up, which I will show you how to download and set up our Java Development Kit on Mac OS. So stay tuned for that as well if you're using Mac. So let's go and download Java and set it up. All right guys, so now we're gonna look at how to download and set up Java, right? So I'm in a Google right now, just type Java download. And the second website you will see oracle.com. Click here. And now you need to download Java Development Kit, in short, JDK. So click here. And now you need to find out your Windows version. So I'm gonna go to my file explorer Let's go to the PC, this PC, right click, go to properties. And now as you can see that I've got 64 bit operating system, right? So now I know that I have to download a Windows X64 PC. I've already downloaded that, so, so I'm not gonna download it now. All you gotta do is just click here, it will start downloading. So I'm gonna go to my downloads and there you go. That's the Java I've downloaded before, right? So if I click on it, and it's going to install. It's a very simple process. I'll show you that. Just click on it and click yes. So this is what you see when you um, in click on the installation package. All you gotta do is just click next, next, next. It will automatically install Java and you don't have to worry about anything, right? So I've already installed that. Just leave the default path as well, okay? I'm gonna cancel that for now. And the next thing after you install your Java, what you have to do is go to your control panel, just search for it. And then in your control panel, type here environment. And then click on edit system environment variables. Click on environment variables. And in this dialog box, you will see um, system variables, right? So you have to create a new variable. Click on new and type here java underscore home and then the variable value would be the part of your java installation folder right so that's pretty simple i'll show you I'll, i've already created that so i'm just going to show you okay there you go java underscore home we're going to double click on it 
so that's the same part of JDK and Java underscore home. Click OK. There's another thing you have to do here is if you go down, click on this part, and here you can see that I've got one um, environment variable here called C program file slash Java slash backslash JDK version number slash bin. That wasn't here before, so all you have to do is just click on new and type this type the part of your installation folder with the backslash and bin at the end very simple i'm going to click ok now click ok and click ok to verify that you have successfully installed java on your system what you have to do is just go to command prompt and here type java space dash version if you see this text, it will tell you Java version 1.8.0 underscore 91. It's pretty fine now. And this next thing you need to verify is Java compiler. So Java C space dash version. And you got the compiler version is 1.8.0, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so we have verified our Java um, development kit. So this is very simple guys, that's how you install and set up your Java development kit and now pretty much every IDK would be able to access Java development kit, right? So hey guys, thanks for watching this video. If you like the information, make sure to subscribe and hit down that thumbs up button and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Chase. Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Always, and I'm back with the fifth part of Java Essential Training Series. So in this video, I'll show you how to download IntelliJ IDEA, which is an IDE, what I will be using in this course. So let's go and download that and I'll show you how to set it up. Oh yeah, don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment below if you have any question. You can follow me on Twitter at OasisMezo01. That being said, let's get into the video. Okay guys, so I'm in a Google right now. I'm going to type IntelliJ. In T IntelliJ idea download and I think that's the first one right so click here okay so now you got two versions community versions ultimate ultimate is a paid version so don't worry about that click on this download link it will start downloading that what one thing you have to um, remember that uh, you need to select a Windows if you're downloading for Windows direct link if you click here okay so now it's downloading so once it's downloaded all you gotta do is just click next 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 it will start installing the software which is really simple setup after that I'll show you how to set it up now I'm gonna show you how to set it up all right guys so this is what you're going to see when you install um, IntelliJ IDEA for the first time so all you gotta do is just click on this configure Go to your project defaults and click on project structure. Here, as you can see that it's telling me there is no SDK. So all you got to do is just click on SDKs and click on this plus sign, select JDK. And now you need to browse to the Java development kit. Okay, so I'm already there, which is going to be C, program file, Java, JDK, blah, blah, blah. And then click on this folder, click OK. I've already added that, so I'm not going to do that. So this is what you're going to see. So source part, annotation, documentation part, it's all good, right? So I'm going to click OK. So that's how you can set up your IntelliJ IDEA, which is really simple. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Uh, if you have any trouble installing IntelliJ IDEA, let me know in the comments below. Make sure to subscribe, and you can follow me on Twitter if you want. And if you have any question. I'm always available on Twitter. So thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. This is where back with the sixth part of our Java Central Training Series. So this is video about IntelliJ IDEA, how to create a project in that. And we're gonna go and make our Hello World program. So whether you learn any programming language in school, college, anywhere, first program is going to be Hello World. So in this video, I'll show you how to create a project in IntelliJ IDEA, and I will explain Hello World program. So that's being said, let's get started. I'll click Create New Project. I'll choose Java as a type of the project, and I'll set my project SDK to 1.8. 
test ticket that I defined when I installed IntelliJ IDEA. I'll click next and on the, on the screen, I will select the option to create a project from a template, command line app. That will create a class that has a main method, just like Java class I created previously. On this screen, I will set the name of the project to Hello World, and then I will change the project location. I will roll to my desktop and I will create a new folder and click OK. And then I will append the name of the project Hello World to the folder which are root folder of the project. Next I will set the base package. I will use the same package that I used previously, com.example.java. When you do this through IntelliJ IDEA, you will add this base package declaration to the Java code, but you will also create an equivalent folder hierarchy to store the class. And then I will click finish to create a project. I'm told that this project file directly doesn't exist. I will click OK to create it and the create Java code. Now if this is the first time you have done this in IntelliJ IDEA, your display won't look exactly like me. Down at the bottom of the screen, you will see a message saying indexing and you will need to wait until that complete before you follow along with the next step. But when the setup process is complete, you should see the display with the project window on the left and on the edit and the editor on the right. I'm going to maximize this window so we can see more clearly. You will also notice that I have line number being displayed on the left. All right guys, so I've cleared everything here in the project. So I'm gonna start a project now. First of all, what you have to do is define a package. So type package com.example.java. So what is this basically? When you were creating a project in IntelliJ IDEA, you defined the base package. So it's going to end with a semicolon, right? So I'm gonna show you what that means basically. So if you go to your project folder hello world and in the source there's a folder com example and java in that java there's a class main.java because i debugged my program before that's why it has created a main class okay so let's go back to our intellij idea now so this is how you define a package to declare a java class start with the keyword public that's called an access modifier. It means the class I'm about to declare is available to entire application. Then add the keyword class and then the name of the class, which I will simply call a main with an uppercase M. All Java class names should start with the uppercase initial character. Next, add a code block consisting a pair of braces. In most Java coding examples, you will see the opening braces appear on the same line as the preceding keyword and then the closing braces should go down to the next line and can align with the first keyword such as public. Now anything I declare inside the core block will be a part of the class. To run the class from the console, I need a method called main and there are a few keywords I need first. The first, the keyword public, which again is an access modifier and the keyword static, that's a keyword that means that is a member of a class that can be called from a class itself as opposed to an instance of the class if that doesn't make sense don't worry i'll talk a lot more i'll talk a lot more about it in the later videos and then the keyword white which means this method won't return any value and finally the name of the method main this is required method name all method names should start with the initial lowercase character and that's how you can distinguish the identifier says of the class name main and a method named main. The name of the method and its arguments make up this method signature and the required main method signature receives an array of string values. We'll declare an array of strings with the keyword string with an uppercase S. That means it's a class identifier followed by the pair of brackets and that means there's more than one string, it's an array. The name of its arguments can really be anything you like but it's typically named arg. I will add a closing parenthesis to the end of the method signature and then I will add another code block and I will fix the tabulation to show where the method starts and it ends. Now I will add a single line code here, just type system dot out dot print ln with a pair of parentheses 
add a double quote and then I'm gonna type hello world from always okay and at the end you need to type a semicolon every statement in Java will finish with the semicolon right so now I'm gonna show you how to debug this program and run it so let's go to a build and click on make project which will debug this project and now we need to run it you can go to run menu and click on run menu or you can just simply click here okay as you can see that down here we got over uh, program it's basically that uh, statement basically what it did it printed that hello world from a vice if I change this oops I made a mistake here so I'll run that again now I will change that to hello world from always. So on the left you got your packages view, right? So if you click here, you can change that to project view, basically which give you more um, information about your project. Let's go to our project files. And here you got everything including your file, including the IML file, which is which has a lot of information about um, IntelliJ IDEA project. Most of the time in this um, course, I'll be working in package, access the package folder directly. So I don't have to see a lot of folders here. All right. So thanks for watching, guys. This was a quick um, getting started video with Java in IntelliJ IDEA. Stay tuned for the next video. We'll be coming up soon. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. And don't forget to subscribe. Hey guys, what's going on? This is us back with the seventh part of our Java essential training. So in this video, I'll be talking about using Java API documentation. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe now. And if you like this information, give this video a thumbs up. And I hope you guys enjoying this course. So let me know in the comments below if you have any question. All right. So that's being said, let's get started. Okay. So let's say if you want to find out about any class, any object, anything in Java. So what do you do? You click here and then press F1, right? So it gives you information about your classes, Java object. Well, right now it's telling the system class contains several useful class fields and methods, right? So you can use IntelliJ IDEA to figure out what are the things and if you want to find out any classes, uh, if you want any information about any object or any class, right? Or any method. So, but there is another way that you can access a full complete documentation through the web, right? So I'm going to go to the web now and this is a Java 8 documentation. Let's say if you want to learn about the compiler, I can click on this Java compiler page. Let me go back. If you want to learn about some web services, these are all the web services available. You can even download this full documentation by going to Java SE download. Uh, Java 8 documentation downloads right but it's a big download so I prefer myself to access this documentation online right so what you can do here is let's say if you copy this link right I'm gonna copy this link and let me go back to IntelliJ IDEA I want to show you how you can access the online documentation in uh, IntelliJ IDEA so let me close my project now Okay, so let's go to our configuration, project defaults, project structure, right? So if you go to your documentation part, right, there's nothing here right now. Click on plus sign and then, oops, so click on this plus sign with this circle. That's basically a URL for your documentation. So you really, you will find the exact part already there. But if you don't, you can copy and paste this here. So I'm going to click OK now. And now we have attached um, Java documentation to IntelliJ IDEA. So I'm going to click OK now, right? So let me go and open my project again. And now, uh, if you want to find out about um, system, right? Online documentation. So what I do, Shift F1. OK, it's going to open that uh, browser and then it's gonna take me directly to that object or class or any method you need to find out right so which is really cool so I'm gonna close this now and let's say if you wanna go find out about the main class so shift 
F1. Well, it's not gonna take you there because um, I'll show you one more thing. Yes, if you go to view and let's say if you go to system right and go to view, it's give you a quick documentation and external documentation. So on um, Mac, it's shift F1 and for quick documentation would be F1 only, right? So this is how you can attach the online documentation to IntelliJ IDEA, which is real cool. All right, so that was a quick tutorial um, and stay tuned for the more videos of the series. Thanks for watching. If you have any question, follow me on Twitter at awaysmirza01 and you can follow me on Facebook or Snapchat. Well, links are in the description, so check them out. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Wise back with another part of our Java Central Training Series. So in this video, I'm going to talk about data types. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, please subscribe now. And if you like this video, give this video a thumbs up. And if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And you can follow me on Twitter at awaysmirza01 as well. So that's being said, let's get started. As with nearly all programming language, Java support the use of variable to store data in memory. There are two major classes of variables or data types in Java, known as primitives and objects. Primitive variables or data types are used to store numbers, individual characters, and boolean values. They are stored in the fastest available memory so you can get to the data as quickly as possible. Data names are for primitives are all in lowercase and that's how you can distinguish them from complex object data types which always have an initial uppercase character. Most of the simple values you might store in Java code are primitives, but one data type that absolutely not a primitive is a string. That's a complex object. All variables in Java, whether primitives or objects, must be explicitly data types when they are declared. Java is a strategically type language and that distinguishes it from dynamic languages such as JavaScript or Python. All variables must have their types declared. Here's a classic declaration. int my var is equal to 5. The first part of this data type, it's saying this is an integer value. The one and once the variable is set to integer, it can't change. In JavaScript, for example, you could start off with something as a number and then you could reset its value to a string or you could change it to runtime. In Java, you can't do that and that's because the compiler looks at declaration and allocates memory for you based on the data type you declare. The next part of the declaration is the variable identifier or name. Java naming convention require that variable names or identifiers always start with the initial lowercase character and then you can choose camel case using uppercase characters in the middle of the name to distinguish certain names. In fact, certain IDs including including IntelliJ IDEA know how to read camel case. They do spell checking to make sure you don't type something very badly, but they don't know how to read variables as individual names based where you place the uppercase character. Finally, the value is placed on the right side of the assignment operator, the equal operator. The first two part of declaration are required. You could simply weigh int my var and finish the statement with a semicolon, but that would be establishing the variable but not explaining assigning its initial value. If you want to assign the initial value, you just add the equal operator and the initial literal value you are assigning. Here's the primitive data types for numbers starting with the smallest amount of memory and going to the largest amount of memory. All primitive values are assigned meaning that their range extends from negative to positive numbers. The by data type stores 8 bit of memory. Its minimum value is minus 28 and its maximum value is positive 127. You also have the short int and long integers. Each of them takes an increasing amount of memory and has an increasing range. The most common of these data types you will see is the int. It's a 32 bit value and its range goes from minus 2 million to positive 2 million. If you need to store very large integer, you can use the long data type instead. There are two data types that you can use to store fractional values, float and double. Float is a 32 bit value and double is a 64 bit value. Once again, they both support minimum and maximum values in the negative and positive range. You can look at the Java docs to see the exact values. 
Double values tend to be used most commonly. They give you the largest range and the highest level of precision. Each primitive has something called a helper class. That's a part of the cl that's a part of the Java runtime library. Each of these classes can be used for converting values from one primitive data type to another and do format value using very simple logic. Here are the helper classes. The primitive byte value can be helped by the byte class. Notice that the name of the class always start with an initial uppercase character and that's how you can distinguish the class name from primitive data type name. The helper class of the short is short. The helper class of for integer is integer and here are the other long for long and float for float. In fact, the most common primitive data type, their helper classes are exactly the same name, but that's initial uppercase character. And where there is a difference in the integer, where the primitive is int and the helper class is integer. Here is an example how you might use a helper class. Each of the helper class is a member of the package called java.lang. Just like your own code, Java classes in the runtime library are organized in packages. All classes that are member of java.lang package are available to you always without you having to add any special declaration. The double class support primitive double value. Here is an example of double value. The first word is double the data type and the second is a variable identifier or name double value. The third part is a literal value that I'm assigning it. Notice the letter D at the end. This is saying this is a value which could be interpreted by a compiler as either a float or a double. It's actually set as a double. You will see use of these alpha characters on all the magic literals where the compiler can't figure it out its own. So now I have the value called a double value and I want to convert it to another value. So I'm declaring a byte named a byte value. And then I'm using a method of double helper class called a byte value wrapped around the double value variable and it converts it to byte. And if it necessary, it uh, trun truncates any fractional value. Similarly, the double class has an int value method, a float value to, and to a string method. The string is a special case. All Java classes have a method named to string which is in the charge of converting that object whether it's a numeric or boolean or a more complex object to some to some sort of string the two string method of the double helper class converts the double to a simple string value all numeric primitives have a default value and they always default to a value of zero here is some code where i'm declaring a variable named myint my int. Data type is an integer or a 32-bit value. I don't have an assignment at the end of declaration and then I output that value as a part of string. Starting off with the string literal, the value of my int is then appending or concatenating the int value. Because it defaults to zero, the output will look like this. The value of my int is zero and it's going to be true of all numeric primitives starting from byte going all the way through double. So that's a brief look how I declared variable with primitive data types and a little bit about primitives and their complex helper classes. So the next video is going to be about primitive variables and output their values to a console in IntelliJ IDEA. So stay tuned for that guys. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and share with your friends if anyone want to learn Java. So thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. And don't forget to subscribe and you can follow me on Twitter at awaysmiza01 if you have any question. Thanks for watching in and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Hey guys, what's going on? This is always back with the next part of our Java Essential Training Series. So this video is going to be about declaring and initializing numeric primitives. You can represent numbers in Java as either primitives values or complex object. I'll show you how to represent them as primitives here and then I'll show you how to use helper classes to get information about numeric values. I have a class called main.java. I'll create another class named. So let's go and create another class. So click on new, new and click on Java class. I'm going to name it a max value. So remember every class name should start with the uppercase letter. So max value, I'm going to click on okay. 
So I've got two classes right now, main.java, maxvalue.java. Classes have main method, but no executable code. So in the main class, I will add a code to the main method, and I'm going to declare six variable, each variable, one of the primitive numeric data type. Okay, so I will start with the first variable byte, all right? So type byte and name it b is equal to, literal is going to be one with the semicolon. And then I will add a short. SH is going to be the name and literal one. And then I'm going to add int, which is a 32 bit value. So int i is equal to one. And then long L is going to be the variable name is equal to literal is going to be one. So the compiler looks at the value of 1 and always start with the assumption that it did represent the smallest range and the smallest amount of memory, a byte. But then when you declare the type, it upcasts the value. And if you want to explain with a literal, that is if you want to say uh, this is 1, but it's a long integer. So you need to add an alpha character after the numeric. So for long, that would be a letter L. Typically, you could spell that with a lowercase l, but it's easy to get confused with that number one. So typically, developer use uppercase L. I'll type the uppercase letter L. You could do the same thing with float and double, but um, let's say I will define a variable with the data type float. So type float. I'm going to give a name f is equal to one f. Now, as you can see that I use a lowercase letter, it's because that you can't get confused. So typically developer use a lowercase f. So I'm going to do the same thing with double. So I'm going to define a data type double. D is going to be the variable name is equal to one D. Okay, so now I'm going to print out the value to the console, right? So system dot out dot print ln and I'm going to give the parentheses and I'm going to double quotes and type data type so that's going to be byte and then I'm going to add a concatenation with plus sign I'm going to type b all right and then semicolon right so let's try running it right so I'm going to debug the program first and then let's play that. It's giving me an error right now. I need to add a method. So I haven't added the method yet. So let's add a method. So type public static void main add a parenthesis string values and I'm going to add some brackets and then give arguments ARGS. All right. So next we're going to add a code block braces and then I'm going to copy all of this code let's say control X and then paste it here fix up the tabulation here now let's debug the code it should work fine now and let's run it so as you can see that I've got the answer byte one so I'm going to add a space here right now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to copy this and turn again control V so now I'm going to change all of these data types to whatever I want to print out so I'm going to type short and the variable name is sh so i've changed everything here now as you can see that we got our data types and we got variable names so i'm gonna debug that and i'm gonna run the program so now as you can see that we got the values and we got the float by 1.0 right so now let's have a look how to use helper class to the max value class and i'll add a code in a main method and I will declare a byte value named B and this time I will assign it's a value of 127 so let's go to our max value class first I need to add the method so let's type public static void main is a method name and then give this uh, method array string and then brackets and then arguments which is going to be arg typically R or it's up to you whatever you want to name it okay and now add a code block where I'm going to add executable code now so I'm gonna type byte B is equal to 127 that's its max value okay so next I'm gonna print it out to the console so type 
system dot out dot print ln and then parentheses add a double quotes and then I'm going to type a data type name so which is going to be byte add a space double code and concatenation with plus sign and then b okay all right so let's debug this I'm going to run debug and I'm going to select a max value class it's going to debug that and let's run it it's already been run but let's click on display with it so I've got the byte with 127 value right I will increment the value by one with the expression B plus plus. So let's type B plus plus semicolon. The operator plus plus means increment by one, and then I will copy and paste the line of the code that outputs the value. Okay, so now you guys can see that it wraps around to the minimum value of the data type. To solve this, I'll wrap this bit of code where I'm incrementing the value in a conditional block. I'll use the if statement and I'll try if and then press enter or return. And I will say if b less than equal to byte with the uppercase b dot max value and then I will add a code and I will move this bit of code into the code block. The if statement is pretty obvious. It's asking the question, if condition is true, then there is a Boolean expression wrapped in a parenthesis. The expression starts with the name of variable b and then less than operator, and then byte with the max value. A byte is an uppercase b is a helper class for byte value, and it has a constant or a static field named a max value in all uppercase that represent the largest value that this data type can have. So I'm saying only increment the value if the value of b isn't already at the max value. Then I will run the code again and this time the byte says at 127 because the line of the code is skipped. So you can try the same sort of operation with all of the different primitives and nomadic data types. Set a value and check to see whether it matches the max value or less than the max value. Alright guys, thanks for watching. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching again and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. Hey what's up everybody my name is Awais and I welcome you to another video of Java Essential Training Series. So this video is going to be about Java operators. If you haven't subscribed to my channel please subscribe now and if you like this video give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Let's talk about Java operators now. I've already used a number of Java operators in my examples but I'll take a moment now to go through them in details. Java syntax is based on C. It's a C style language. So it uses most of the same operators you will find in most C style languages, including C, C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, and so on. There are various types of operators. The equality operators are used to compare values to each other. Assignment operators do exactly what it says, assign values. And there are mathematical operators and logical operators. Here are some of the most common assignment and math operators. When you declare a variable in Java, you always start with the data type followed by the name of the variable, but you don't have to immediately assign a value. The default value will depend on whether the variable is a primitive or an object. But if you want to assign a value, you use the single is equal to character as an assignment operator. The data type and a variable name go to the left and the value on the right. This would be a simple assignment, but you can also execute a mathematical operators as you assign a value. These would be expressions that evaluate to the correct data type. The plus operator is for addition. The subtraction operator is for subtraction and the asterisk for multiplication and forward slash for division. There are also a percentage character, which is a remainder operator, also known in some language as a modulus operator. Here are some things you can do with assignment and mathematical operations. I'm starting with the integer value of 10. You can increment and decrement that value with the a++ or a minus minus 
and that operator can go either before or after the variable name. I'll talk about the effect of that in that in just a moment. You can also increment or decrement and assign values at the same time using these operators. Plus is equal to means assign the value and execute the math operation. Minus is equal to does the same for subtraction and also for asterisk is equal to and forward slash is equal to. Now about placing the increment and decrement operators before or after a variable name. Once again, I'm starting with the integer value of 10. If you place the plus plus operator after the variable name, that's called a post fix assignment. You are evaluating the value and then executing the math. In this example, I would be outputting a value of 10, but then resetting the value to 11. If you move the operator before the variable name, that's called a prefix. Then you are executing the math and then evaluating the value. And then your output and your new value would be the same. The equality operator are used to compare values to each other. The double equal sign operator is called the equality operator. With primitive values, it compares the actual values with the reference variables. That is a variable that points to object. You are comparing whether the two variables are pointing to the same object, not necessarily whether they have the same value. The inequality operator, some Java developer calls that exclamation mark, the bang operator, but again, that simply means not equal to, and it has the same rules as the equality operators. Primitive variables are evaluated by their values and reference variables by whether they point to the same object. In addition to is double equal sign and not equal to, you also have a greater than and less than or less than equal to or greater than equal to and a special operator called instruct C of. That's asked whether the object is an instance of a particular class. So for example, if I have a string and I have a condition of s instance of java.lang.string, that's a fully qualified name of that class, then my condition would be true. If I would say yes, this variable is a string, once the exemption to compare values with the string, string cannot be safely compared to each other using the equal operators. It will work in some circumstances and not others. I will describe the details of that later in this course. If you want to compare strings to each other, you shouldn't use the equal to or not equal to operators. Instead, you should use the string classes equal to method. There is one version of this method that's a case sensitive. This one and another version that compares values without case sensitivity. And again, I will describe those details in later videos. The result of the code would be they match. And finally, there are logical operators. The two ampersand is an AND operator. The two pipe characters is the OR character. And you could use those to combine two conditional expressions and get a result. And then there is a ternary operator that looks like this. You examine a boolean condition and then after a question mark, you set a value you want to assign. If the condition is true, and after the colon, a value you want to assign if the condition is false. This is a shorthand for an if-then conditional statement. Some developers love using these expressions. I tend to avoid it. I tend to use a more verbose if-then statement because I think it's easier to read and maintain later on. But this expression absolutely work and is very popular in Java programming world. So that's a summary of the most common use operators in Java. There are a few other include operators known as bitwise operators, but they are used less commonly. And I encourage you to look at the Java documentation for a complete look at all operators that are available in Java programming. Alright guys, thanks for watching. That was a quick tutorial about Java operators. I hope you like this video and if you do, give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheese. Before we start making more advanced programs, we need to capture and store data in our programs. Java is known as strict data typing language. That means that every variable we define must be declared with a data type. And you cannot try changing of data stored in that variable. For example, if you declare a variable to store numbers, you cannot try to store letters in the same variable. 
Let's get started by reviewing a basic type of data we will encounter. The first is character. The character data type allows us to store a single character or a single number or a symbol. The syntax in Java is char. A variable name such as letter A is equal to single quote A, single quote, semicolon, take particular notice of a single quote. This is different than the literal or a string we have used before that had double quotes. Next we have a variable type called boolean, which is a named after a famous mathematician George Bull. It allows us to store a value of true or false. The Java syntax is bool. The variable name such as result is equal to either true or false. We have several data types that are used for strong numbers. They include integers, data types such as byte, short, int, and long. These data types are used for numbers that do not contain any fractional part. For example, if you are counting the numbers of a cars in a parking lot, you're not going to have a half of a car. There are four different types of integers to store different sizes of the number. The smallest one is the byte, which can hold a signed value of minus 127 to positive 127, an unassigned value from 0 to 255. The short, the int, and the long allow for much larger numbers to store rational numbers, which are numbers that include a fractional portion, such as 1.75. We use float and double. For most of the exercise in these videos, I'll be using int and double data types. Choose your data type carefully. For example, if you want to keep track of an hourly wage, it is important to capture the fractional portion of the number. If the hourly wage is 10, $0.95 and you work 10 hours, you want to get paid $109.50. But if you store the hourly rate is an integer variable by mistake, you would only get paid $100 since the $0.95 cents would be lost. The data type we just discussed called primitive data types. The other types of data is known as structured data and we will discuss that when we get to classes and objects. Primitive data types store their value directly in memory with the variable names. Structured data is stored by reference or by adding the location and memory where the data exists. Let's think about a few more examples. I will give you an example and you tell me the correct data type. Again, how about the number of cars in the parking lot? If you said it, you are correct. Now, how about the price of a grocery item? This should be double a float since it contain a decimal point. A vowel double quotes a double quote question mark. We use the data type character or char. The value true is boolean and the number of the student in the classroom would be an integer. Again, you can't have the half of a student. All right, guys, that was a quick tutorial about data types in Java. I hope you like it. If you do, give this video a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. And I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. Hey guys, what's going on? This is always back with the next part of our Java Central Training Series. So in this video, I'll be talking about strings and variables. So the string class represent character strings. All strings literals in Java, such as let's say ABC, are implemented as instance of this class. Strings are constants. Their value cannot be changed after they are created. Strings buffers support immutable strings because string objects are immutable and they can be shared. All right guys, so let's have a look at the string, how to create a string. So first of all, we need to define a data type, which is going to be string with a capital S. So type string is equal to, now I'm going to make a variable. I'll talk about the variables in a moment, but let's look at it for now. All right, so I'll type first name. I'll use the camel case. Camel case means the first character is going to be the lower character and the second word is going to have an uppercase letter is equal to and string always goes in a double quote so I'll type double quotes and I'll type my name always right and then I will add a semicolon so this is a basic string statement so this is a data type that's a variable name which contains this value so basically strings is a sequence of characters so let's say if you want to add a character so I'll type a data type char and I'll name it, let's say, f name is equal to, you gotta add brackets here for the character. So this is the way you define characters. So I'll type with the braces on, I'll have to type single quotes, a single quotes, comma, c 
single card and it raises and so there is basically no difference between um, this value so if I print out this F name it's going to give me same output as the first name let's have a look so let's say S O U T so that's basically a short form to write system dot L dot print line so I'll type first name and I will copy this code and paste it down and then I'll change the variable name to F name okay so let's run this program now okay so as you can see that the output is basically the same so the the variable contains the data always in character data type and a string is a sequence of that character so that's basically a string all right let's have a look at the methods we have in the string first of all let me go to the java documentation this is a, um this is official documentation from oracle so if you go to string class here all right if you click here as you can see that a part of the java.lang package so let's go down here okay so these are all the methods we have okay so i'm gonna show you how to um, check the length of the string right so let's go back to IntelliJ idea I'm going to get rid of this statement and I'll type let's say system dot out dot print ln and then I will type first name again and I will add a decimal point and I will type length right and let's output it to the console okay so you should have a waste in five so now basically that method is giving us the length of the variable contains this data so we have five characters one two three four five okay so let me check that if it that is equal to f name right so we're gonna go and change this let's say okay so i'm going to now equals and now i'll type f name right so basically what i'm doing is i'm asking this statement that first name which is this variable is equal to f name so this is a boolean data type right so it's going to tell me if it's equal to f name or not so let's run this program now so should give me the always false so this is basically that statement let me get rid of that right let's run the program again now it's false right so if you go to your java uh, documentation there should be a lot of um, the, uh, methods here so you need to know what matter you want to use so this is how you can find out so let's see that's a boolean data type equals right that's what i used before so these are all the methods available here you can find out so let's try one more thing to uppercase right so if you want to convert your string to uppercase you can do that as well so let me change this to lowercase a and then what i do here i'm just going to get rid of this okay decimal point and then to uppercase okay now if you print out this statement it's giving an error why it's giving an error because there's another okay now it should be fine first name variable contains a waste in a lowercase but this method basically converted that to the uppercase so that's how you can use a methods with the strings so literally this course i'll talk about strings and methods more in details all right guys so let's talk about the variables now variable is the name of a memory location and there are three types of variable local instance and static let me give you a quick example let's say you have a water and a clothes right so you have two objects as well a glass and a box would you put water in a box or would you put clothes in a glass so the variable whatever you're defining needs to be defined by its data type so the water goes in a glass and a clothes goes in a box so same thing here if you are defining a string variable you need to define its data type which is going to be string if it's an integer value you need to define that as an integer so let's start a string variable so i'm gonna start with the string s with a capital s string all right so let's name it let's say my name right i'm using a camel case here as well so my name is equal to and string goes in a double quotation so so always mirza okay and then i will finish that statement with a semicolon 
Now let's add another string variable. So type string and let's say my age is equal to is okay and then another variable I'm going to type that as an integer now okay so my age is is equal to so while defining an integer variable you don't need double quotation you just type let's say my age is 28 okay and then I'm going to print it out to the console right so I'll type s out and then I will use my name first and then I will concatenate with the plus operator and then my age and then plus and my age is okay and let's run the program okay it's basically so waste is 28 right so you need to add a space here let's run it again okay so we have three variables here string variable which is containing my name string variable which is containing this is I could type that is here as well and then integer variable which contains 28 so defining a variable is pretty simple all you have to do is define it by data type so boolean data type character by chart integer long float and double let's uh, print it out again system dot s out so let's say my cross okay so now it's going to print out that 28.666 right so if i change that data type to integer right and my value is still 28.666 now it's going to give you an error because it's telling you that the value available here is basically a double value so we need a double data type let's run this and let's see as you can see that it's giving an error so the variable basically needs a correct data type and a correct value format right so all right guys so that's about variables and strings so thanks for watching and i'll talk to you guys in the next video so don't forget to subscribe as well cheers hey what's me everybody my name is always and I'm welcome to this video of java central training series so this video is going to be about getting user input from console. I'll be making a simple addition and subtraction tutorial in this video as well. So stay tuned. Let's get started. All right, guys. So I have a main class here. So how to get input from the console. So let me add another class here. Sorry, we need to add another package here called imp scanner. So I'm going to import java.util.scanner and you need to type semicolon at the end. So now let's use that scanner class, right? So let's add a few things here. So let me use scanner, right? And then I'm going to name variable scan, okay? Is equal to new, which is a keyword, and then scanner again. And then here you need to type system.in. So if you type system.out, it's going to print out to the console, so we need input from the console so that's why i'm using system dot in all right semicolon at the end so we have created our set our scanner class now so now let's add some variables so int i'm going to add x with comma and y so now we have two variables x and y so now let me add a, a message to the console i'm using s out and i'm going to type enter your first value okay and now I'm going to use x, okay, which is an int variable, is equal to scan, which is the variable name of the scanner, all right? And then I'm going to use dot next int. So the reason why I'm using next int is because that's an integer uh, variable, not a float, not a double, not a string, right? So I'll, I'll show you how to use the strings and double as well in a second. All right, so we have got x. So now I'm going to s out to the console. We to enter second value, okay? 
and then we're going to use y variable same as x scan dot next int with a semicolon so these two uh, variables will be asked for a value on the console so let's run this program okay now it's asking you enter your first value and we type 2 and then the second value 2 right so the the, the the program basically finished there so now I'm going to add another variable here I'm going to add result so let me type as, uh, the data type as well so Java is a uh, data type stricken language so all yet every time you declare a variable you need to type a data type as well so let me use int result is equal to in the parentheses I'm going to do x plus y okay and with the semicolon at the end now I'm going to print it out to the console so let's use s out again and then this is the result right semicolon let's give a space here semicolon and plus operator for the concatenation and then use result right let's run this now okay now I'm going to type 6 and 4 the result should be 10 as you can see that the result is 10 now so let's make a bit more complex program here so I'm going to get rid of this line here and let's say I get rid of this line as well so now we have two variables x and y I'm asking their values from the console okay so now let's ask for a few more things here so I'm going to add another variable I'm going to type string variable okay I'm going to name it operation okay is equal to I'm going to use scan class and then dot next okay this is going to be a string class now okay so before that I'll have to ask for the operator so I'll use s out enter the operator okay that's fine all right so down here what we do now we're going to ask for operator there so I'm going to use the logical sorry conditional statement now so if parenthesis operator dot equals to a string because as you know the operator is a string value so I'm going to ask string so it's plus then add a code block and then print s out for printing out this is the addition result okay and then use plus operator for concatenation and then type type uh, let's say we can do parentheses again x plus y okay done done semicolon done okay and now we're going to add else statement else if operation equals to minus then I'm going to add another code block here with the braces here and I'm going to add s out for printing out to the console and this is the subtraction result result okay and then add your plus for concatenation and then in the parentheses say x minus y okay with the semicolon and then maybe add another code block sorry net another else statement let's say else if operation dot equals it's a method it's a method for operation variables so we can use that I've shown you that uh, methods how to find them from the Java documentation so if you don't know about this you need to uh, watch my previous videos so equals I'm going to add a string which is going to be a asterisk so let's add another code block here so I'm going to type s out for printing out this is the multiplication okay use the plus operator for concatenation and then say in a parenthesis x asterisk y done okay now let's add another one here okay so else if operation dot equals 
in the double quotes with because the string goes in a double quotes forward slash right I'm going to add a code block here again s out add the double quotes for the string values so I'm going to this is the division okay plus for the concatenation again and then in the parentheses x forward slash for division y right that's done okay that's all right so let's add a last condition here else else okay if else i'm going to add a code block here okay s out and I'm going to type, if someone type something else instead of plus minus multiplication as subtraction operators, you can just uh, print out this. Um, okay, so I'm going to print it out that enter the correct operation. Okay, so you can print out this message to the console. All right, so now let's debug this and run the class. All right, so I'm going to add, let's say six, and then six for second value, and then operator is going to be plus, enter. So the result is 12, okay? So which is, I'm going to add a space here. This is kind of uh, four operations you can apply. So let's run that program again. And all right, so let's say three minus, sorry one and then minus operator now the result is true so that was a quick tutorial about getting input from console and i've shown you some um, if statement as well but i've got a separate video for complete details how to use if statements so check that out as well if you want to know about this thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe and i'll talk to you guys in the next video Alright guys, what's going on? This is always back with another part of the Java Central Training Series. We use if and else statement in Java, but let me give you an example of what is if and else statement. Let's say you are in a 10th standard and before the night you're going to get your result for your 10th standard exams. Maybe your mom come up to you and say, if you get 75% marks, you're going to get laptop. And if you get lower than that, you're going to get kicked out from the house. So there are two conditions here basically. Either you're going to get a laptop or you're going to get kicked out from the house. And there's another statement we use in Java, if, else, if, else, if, else. So else if can be used many times. So let's say your dad come up to you and tell you that if you get 90% marks, you're going to get a laptop. 80% marks, you get a mobile. 70% marks, you're going to get a PlayStation 4. And if you get lower than that, you're going to get kicked out. So that's a quick example that there are a few conditions that has to go. There's going to be only one condition which is going to be true. So I'm going to go to my computer now and I will apply those conditions and let's see what we get. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe now. And you can give me feedback in the comments below. You can follow me on Twitter at oasemirza01. Thanks for watching, so let's get started. All right, guys, before we talk about if and else and else if statements, right, I'm going to import a scanner class. So let's add a scanner class. So import java.util.scanner, okay? And now I'm going to create a scanner here. Let's add scanner. I'm going to name it scan, okay? Is equal to new is a keyword. And then scanner again. And then I'm going to type system.in. So this is going to help us to input data from the console. Okay, so now let's add some variables here. So I'm going to add two variables, int x, y. Okay, so we have two variables now, int x and y. Let's add, okay, so now I'm going to ask uh, from the user to input the x value. So s out for x value, so enter, the x value okay done and then x is equal to I'm going to type scan which is my variable for the scanner which is going to scan from the console dot next int and semicolon all right so s out again and I'm going to enter the y value okay that's done and I'm going to ask for a y value again all right 
so y is equal to scan and dot next int right so we got x value from the console y value from the console right so now let's compare them so i'm going to say that if x is greater than y then print out to the console s out for the printing out and then x is greater than y okay and i'm going to type another statement here okay uh, let's add another statement which is going to be else okay and i'm going to in the parentheses i'm going to say we don't need the parentheses now because we're not giving any condition so if that doesn't happen the else statement will um will run okay so i'm going to add a code block here now and with that s out okay and then we say y is greater than x okay so let's run this program now okay i'm going to add 22 and y value let's say 10 okay so now it's telling me that x is greater than y so that basically a statement um was true so that run that's the message all right so now let's add a few more things here okay else if okay i'm going to say x dot equal sorry space equal assi is an assignment operator y and then i'm going to add a code block here i'm going to system out x is equal to y right so we got three statements so we have x is greater than y if x is equal to y then print out this message else print out this message let's run the program now okay i'm going to type 10 and y value 10. so now it's telling me that x is equal to y all right so let's run this program again and let's say 22 and 10 so now x is greater than y okay so that was a quick tutorial about if else and else statement so first going to be if statement then another condition and then the last condition you can add as many as condition you want depending on your program um, and then you can at last you can type else statement right so that was a quick tutorial guys uh, if you have any questions let me know in the comments below thanks for watching and i'll talk to you guys in the next video Cheers. what's going on everybody my name is always and i welcome you to this video of java essential training series so this video is going to be about logical operators so we have two logical operators and and or so first let me import my scanner class java.util scanner and semicolon at the end so first let's have a look at the and operator right so i'm going to use that scanner class i'm going to type scanner i'm going to make a variable here scan is equal to new scanner again and then i'm going to give system dot in because i want a value from console okay so now let's make an integer variable so int marks is equal to i'm going to say scan which is a variable name for scanner class dot next dot int that's right okay but first let me print out the message to the console so s out and say enter your marks this program is basically that feedback from your parents let's say your marks get from 80 to 100 you get the feedback well done if you get 60 to 80 you get the feedback you need some improvement and then if you get lower than that they're gonna tell you to get out from the house so let's create that okay so we got that and now i'm going to add a conditional statement so if i'm going to add parentheses another parenthesis because i'm going to use a logical operator so i'm going to say marks greater than equal to 80 and so that ampersand sign is a and operator so two ampersand basically is a uh, and operator so i'm going to add another parenthesis and i'm saying marks less than equal to 100 okay and i'm going to add a code block here 
and I'm going to print out a message to the console well done keep it up okay so now let's make another condition statement so else if okay marks greater than equal to 60 and I'm going to add another operator here and marks less than equal to 79 okay let's add another parenthesis here because it's gonna give us error after that alright so now I'm going to add a code block here okay and then I'm going to print out a message to the console this is a feedback from your parents so as out you can say need some improvement okay all right so we got two conditional statements here let's add the last one so else add a code block and I'm going to say you need to get out from house okay that's a that's a very rude feedback from your parents but this is just a part of the program okay so let's run this program now it's gonna ask me enter your marks I'm going to type 60 so now it's told me need some improvements right so if statement has two conditions here marks greater than is equal to 80 and marks less than equal to 100 so these two condition needs to be true to run this code right otherwise it will jump to the next one else if so these two condition has to be true to run this code and the last code will be run if both of the conditions are false so and operator basically you can apply two or more let's say i'll add another parenthesis here and say marks equal to 60 let's say 65 or maybe let's say 85 okay 85 all right so now what it's going to do is basically I'm going to add an operator so here okay let's run the program now okay all right so if I add here let's say I will type 80 so this should run right but as you know that 80 and 85 is not there so these three condition has to be true so this is true this is true but this is false because the marks are not equal to 85 so that's why it's telling me you need to get out from the house all right so let's run this program again and type the marks 85 okay so now these three conditions are true that's why it's giving me feedback well done keep it up let's get rid of this condition here okay all right so now we're gonna use the or statement right so let's change this to or operator this is a symbol for the or operator okay all right so any one of these state condition will uh, be true then this code will be executed so let's try this now okay if I type let's say 40 right it's still that telling me that well done keep it up the reason why but because that condition was false but that condition came out true because marks less than equal to 100 which is 40 which is fine so it's going to execute this statement so that's the difference between logical and logical operators and operator and or operator all right so um that's it for this video. If you have any question, let me know in the comments below or you can follow me on Twitter at OISMIRZA01. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. Hey guys, what's going on? This is always back with another tutorial of Java Central Training Series. So this video is going to be about arrays so normally array is a collection of similar type of elements that have a contiguous memory location java array is an object that contains elements of a similar data type it's a data structure where we can store similar added items so we can store only fixed set of items in java array so there are two types of array available in java 
that's a single dimensional array and a multi dimensional array. So first we're going to look at single dimensional array. So the advantages of Java array is it can make code optimized. We can retrieve or sort the data easily. We can get any data located at any index number. So indexing in array start from zero. So I'm going to go and start creating an array now. So I will explain that while we go. All right, so first of all, I'm going to import um, my scanner class import java.util.scanner with the semicolon at the end. All right, so to, uh, the syntax of uh, creating an array is basically, first of all, you need to define what kind of array you are making. Is it double? Is it an integer? Is it a string or float? So I'm going to create a double data type array so type double okay and then to create an array to tell the computer that it's an array you need to use square brackets okay so now the computer knows that we are creating an array next what's the variable name so i'm going to say um, prices so basically i'm making a program of a grocery list so let's say you have 100 items right and you need um, if you're not creating an array for that program you need to create a hundred string variables to store the item names and uh, you need a, another hundred variables to store its prices so i'm going to create a um, variable prices okay and then it's equal to and now you need to use the keyword new and then data type again which is double and then i'm going to create uh, how many uh, values we need to store in the prices so i'm gonna say five values right so the five values is basically has index so start from zero to four that's going to be five values okay and then semicolon at the end so we have created an array but before that i'm going to use that scanner class but i want a values from the console okay so I use scanner okay and then say in is a variable is equal to new scanner again and i'm going to get value from system so system dot in okay so now we have creating an array and we're going to use that array um, to get input from this console okay so i'm going to print out to the system now that um, enter five values so i'm going to say system dot out dot print ln okay and then say enter five values semicolon at the end now we need to use that array so to use that array simply type the variable name prices okay and then um brackets sorry um yeah single uh, square brackets and then say index so we have five values in the prices so i'm going to start with the zero so zero is equal to i'm going to say in okay which is a scanner class in there okay and then i'm going to place a decimal point and it's a double array right so data type is double so i'm going to use a next double and then semicolon at the end so i'm going to copy and paste this five times copy this and paste it five times one two three four five okay now let's use um index one two three oops three four right so we have five values we have defined a five index of uh, five uh, values for the prices as well so it's one two three four five and then we're going to get input from the console right all right so now i'm going to add another variable which is going to be a double it's a data type and i'm going to say total is equal to I'm going to use the prices and I'm going to use a square brackets zero okay so I'm going to use the plus operator for adding the prices together so let's copy and paste this five times to save the time okay copy and let's say paste 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 so one two three four five you don't need um, plus operator at the end you need to put semicolon all right so I'm going to change so add price zero one and then one and then two three four so basically the five values so i'm going to change that to one 
change this to 2 and change this to 3 and 4 okay so we got a double um, total variable which has a double data type and we adding these five values in that array enter now let's print out the result on the console so let's say s out for system out dot print line i'm going to say uh, in a square in a double quotes the total values of all item all five items okay and then plus and then the variable total done let's run this program okay now it's asking me to enter five values i'm going to say five i can uh, go for a decimal point as well because my array has a double data type okay so let's say 5.3 4.26, 7.2, that's a random word. So the result I'm having is 27.7, okay? Here, I'm going to change a formatter here. So instead of using println, I'm going to use printf, okay? And then here in the double quotes, I'm going to add a modifier. So with the dollar sign on the left, and the modifier style with the percent date sign and I want I have five items and I'm going to put a decimal and I want two values on the right so two and then I'm going to make it um, float so this is a float value so I'm going to type F okay so here when you use the printf formatter you need to use the comma instead of plus operator all right so now let's run the program again all right, so now let's say I will write 3, 3.5, 2.5, 3.2, 1.2. .2. All right, so now as you can see that the total value of all five items are $13.40, okay? So that's how you define the formatter as well. So that was a single dimensional array. All right, guys, thanks for watching this tutorial. And the next video is going to be about switch statement. So stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching again. Talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. Hey, what's going on, everybody? My name is Always, and I welcome you to do another video of Java Central Training Series. So this video is going to be about unary operators, basically increment and decrement operators in Java. So we have increment operators. I'm going to write that in the comments. Let's say plus plus is an increment operator and minus minus is a decrement operator sorry yep so we have two kinds of operator but we can do that as a post increment and a pre increment so let's say if I type X and I say plus plus this is a post increment because we are incrementing the X value after the X value okay so if I type plus plus first and X that's a pre increment so value will be incremented before that X right so to give you a quick example I'm going to define int x okay is equal to one right i'm going to make x is equal to one and now i'm going to print it out to the console so s out for that and then i'm going to type x right so the value i'm going to get is one okay so let me increment it by one now so plus plus okay what value we're going to get we're going to get the value of one again the reason why because when it is uh, printing out to the console the value has been increased after that okay so give you an example i'm gonna do another s out and then let's print out the x so the next x value is going to be two because x the value of x is one right now and then it's incremented and then the next x we are printing out is going to be two to uh, simplify that what is it basically let's say if you want to add a value to the x what do you do basically so you do x is equal to x plus one okay so s out x value so you're gonna get x value two let's see okay so to simplify we have a unary operators in java which can increment a value by one or decrement the value by one all right so let me give you another example of pre-increment so i'm going to define few variables here so let's say num1 
int num2 int num3 okay and down here I'm going to um, num1 is equal to 100 okay and num2 is equal to pre-incremented num1 okay at this stage we have the value of num1 is equal to 101 because it's been pre-incremented all right let me just uh, print it out to the console so num1 okay so let's see the result so we have the result 101 because it's been pre-incremented on this line okay all right so i'm going to get rid of this line now all right so right now if we print out num2 okay and then print it out the value of one num2 is 101 as well because that was incremented on this line so the next line says num1 is equal to num1 basically that's been that uh, expression the pre-increment has been applied to this line because it's a pre-increment right so we have the value of 101 for num2 and num1 all right so let me get rid of this statement first okay so now i'm going to use num3 this is going to be a bit complicated but i will explain that okay so now i'm going to use num2 okay post incremented and add this to pre incremented num1 okay so let me explain to you guys okay so right now if you go to this line the num2 value is going to be 102 because let me just print it out to the console right so num2 value okay let's just see the result 102 because now on this line num1 is being pre-incremented by 102 so that value num2 is equal to 102 now so the num1 basically has been incremented twice okay so if I print out num3 here so can anyone guess what's going to be the result the result is going to be 203 why I will explain that in a second let's look at the result all right so it's kind of complicated but let me explain to you guys okay so right now the num1 value here the old value was 101 right and the new value changed to on this line okay the new value basically changed to um 102 okay so here num2 is basically a post increment so it is using the old incremented value which which was 101 so if we print out let's say num2 because it's going to print out at a new value on this on this line okay so the result is going to be 203 and 102 okay so if you have any confusion here let me explain to you one more time so right now we have the value of 102 so num1 on this line basically is 102 okay because of this statement or expression right but because we are not incrementing any of the we're not incre pre-incrementing num2 it's a post increment so that is why the num2 is still using old value of 101 on this line okay so that is why we get the value of 203 let me just uh, print out all of them so let's change this to one two and then print out the next one as out and num3 okay so let's look at the result here so result is 203 okay if you are getting confused about why it's giving 102 and why it's adding only one digit and the result is 203 because because uh, we are basically adding pre-incrementing the num1 here on this line so when the compiler comes down here it reads this and change the value to 101 and here the num2 is equal to num1 so that's a 101 value there okay but the, when the compiler comes down to this line it says that num02 is post incremented it hasn't been incremented yet so the old value was num2 was 101 and it goes to the next operator plus add pre-incremented num1 so it jumps back to num1 so that's going to be incremented again so the num1 is going to change to 102 but 
when it comes down again it says oh it's been incremented again so num2 is equal to num1 that's why it changed that to 102 as well so when it comes down so it goes twice so that's a bit confusing but if you have any question uh, let me know in the comments below and you can follow me on twitter at the waste Mirza. so that was a quick example of pre-increment and post-incremented Thanks for watching guys and um, don't forget to subscribe and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. In the next video I'm going to talk about switch statement in Java. Alright, cheers. Guys, what's going on? This is always back with another video of uh, Java Central Training Series. So in this video I'll be talking about switch statement. So basically switch statement is alternated to if and else statement in Java. Switch is a case sensitive, it's similar to C++ switch. Sieve's, uh, switch statement allow you to um, choose a block of statement to run from a selection of code based on the return value of an expression. The expression used in a switch statement must return integer or a string value. Alright, so I'm gonna give you a quick example how to use a switch statement. So let's start by declaring a variable. I've imported um, scanner class, so let's do the other way. Okay, so I'm going to make a scanner here. Okay, and I'm going to give a value scan, okay, is equal to new scanner, right? And then I'm going to type system.in to take input from the console. Okay, now let's declare a variable. So I'm going to int, okay, I'm going to say month is equal to, okay, and I'm going to use scan dot next byte, or uh, next integer, because it's a integer. Um, variable okay so we got that right okay so now I'm going to make a switch statement here okay first let's print out something so I'm going to enter the number to display a month name okay all right so we got that here now let's use a switch statement so I'm going to switch okay I'm going to apply that to month so I'm going to use month okay and then a block of code all right and then down here we're going to type case so the case one if it's a one okay if we press one from the console which is a scanner class there so what it should do okay so you need to type a colon here a full column to apply the case and now s out right so if that case happens I need to print out January okay that's done all right so the next statement is a break statement so what it does basically if they that statement becomes true it will break the code and it will not execute the code anymore it's that simple if that's happen okay this will break the code and it will jump to the the last part of the code it will finish the program okay so the next case so we're going to type case 2 okay if that case 2 happens then print out okay February I don't know if I spelled that right or not but it doesn't really matter and I'm going to type a break statement again if that happens break the program okay case 3 okay and you use this full column and then s out and then let's say march for number three right break it done case four and let me do that 12 times and then once i'm done i come back all right so just give me a second all right so i've written down that case is 12 cases so number one january number two february and so on okay so the last thing what i want to do here is if none of that thing happen let's say if we write 13 or 14 what it should do it should do i'm going to default and i'm going to press enter and then system out i'm going to say that enter the right number okay so we have 12 cases here in the switch statement it's very simple case one full colon and print out this and if that happens break the program okay so let's run this program now i'm gonna click on this play icon and it's going should ask us enter okay so here we need to uh, get that let's say if i type 2 enter 
so it's telling me that enter the number and February one thing we have to change here okay we have to cut this line and paste it on the top of our variable all right let's just fix up the tabulation all right so let's run the program again and it should ask first to enter the number all right so I'm going to try let's say 35 right what did you say enter the right number so this is a quick example of sweet statement you can do that with the strings as well so with the string if you change that to let's say uh, I'm going to get rid of uh, some of the cases here let's say we only need three of them all right I'm going to get rid of it I'll change I'll show you how to do it with this string okay so with that I'm going to change that to the data type of my variable to string and then I'm going to change that to next dot into only next which takes a string from console okay here I'm going to change that to name and on the top we need to change the variable name as well name all right so the case one okay so it should print my name I'll change that to a waste Mirza and the next time I'll say John and I'll say Alex and then I will s default I'll say uh, the person doesn't exist okay so we got three cases so I want to do here if I say let's say I want to do let's say in a double quotes okay in the double quotes you can type let's say just gonna go into double quotes okay always if I type always let's make it lowercase and then print out this okay and then second case in double quotes you say John okay print out John and if I say um, double quotes Alex should print out Alex and then that's it all right so let's uh, run the program now let's see what it says it's still gonna tell me enter the number but um, I have to type uh, let's say I'll type away should say away smirza that's right so you can make it work with the strings and integers um, it does work with the double and float values as well so that was a quick tutorial on sweet statement i hope you like it if you need more explanation let me know in the comments below so thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe and i'll talk to you guys in the next video chase hey guys what's going on this is always back with another video of java central training series so this video is going to be about while loop so in java while is an iteration statement like for and do while loops it's also called a loop control statement. While statement repeatedly execute the same set of instruction until a termination condition is met. So the condition is any Boolean expression. The body of the loop will be executed as long as the condition expression is true. So when condition becomes false, control passes to the next line of code immediately following the loop and it ends the program. So I'm gonna give you an example let's say I will define a variable I will name it count is equal to one all right and then I'll use the while loop so I'll say while and expression goes in a parenthesis so I will say well count is less than 10 okay and what it do I will press enter and curly braces it's a code block all right so I'll say print out count right so let me explain to you what compiler sees here so compiler start a program and then it says there's a variable data type integer and has a value of one and comes down and sees that oh there's a while loop so count is less than 10 then print this count value so as long as the value is lower than 10 it's going to keep printing so right now the int count value is 1 so it's going to keep printing it's going to be an infinite loop so let me give you an example let me run this program okay as you can see that it's going to keep running and it's an infinite loop so to stop that manually go to the run menu and stop main okay so let me give you another um, example here let's add increment operator into the while loop so I will say count 
plus plus semicolon. So now what it's going to do, it's going to read that count variable data type integer is equal to one and comes down while loop. It's going to see that while loop is lower than 10, then print out the count value. And then it comes down here and then um, it's going to add one into the count value. So the count value is going to be two. So it's going to keep printing until it uh, reaches the 10 or it's lower than 10, which is going to be nine. So if I run the program now, it's going to print one, two, three, four, five, up to nine. To add prints, you need to add equal to, and then let's see, it's going to add 10 in the result as well. Okay, so basically the while loop does it, it executes the code until it's true. When it becomes small, it stops the program. Simple as that. All right, so that was a quick video on while loop. Next video is going to be do while loop. And then after, I'm going to talk about the for loop, okay? So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And I'll talk to you guys in the next video. And if you have any um, uh, questions, let me know in the comments below. Or you can follow me on Twitter at OasisMirza01 on Twitter. Thanks for watching. Talk to you guys in the next video. Hey guys, what's going on? This is always back with another video of Java Central Training Series. So in the previous video, I've explained to you guys while loop. So I have that same code, but I made that in the comments, so it's been grayed out. So let's look at the do while loop uh, first. Okay, so in Java, do while is an iteration statement again, like for loop and while loop. It's also called a loop control system. Do while statement is exit controlled loop because condition is checked at last moment. So irrespectively of the condition control enters into the do while loop after the completion of the body execution, condition is checked whether true or false. If condition is false, then it will jump out of the loop, otherwise it will execute the code. So let me give you an example, okay? So I'll give you a syntax for do while loop. So just type do, okay? And then you need to add curly braces, okay? And in the curly braces, let's say I will type, let's define an int, um, just a variable first. So int, int, let's say y, yeah, x is equal to one, okay? All right, so in the do, I'm going to say that print out x value, okay? And then I'm going to check while it's the, the condition. So I'm going to say while, Okay, and then the condition is going to be, let's say, x less than zero. Okay, sorry, zero. All right, so, all right, so we got our loop done, and then in the loop, you need to add um, a semicolon at the end, right? So let's run the program now. I want to show you the difference between while and do while loop. So as you can see that we got the result of one, okay? But the same loop at the top, we have a while loop, okay? So let's look at the result for while loop as well. So I'm just going to get rid of it. Let's um, create a separator here. So I'm just going to say blah, 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 dash, okay? And then this is going to be a separator. All right, so we have the do while loop here and then same condition we have in a while loop. So the count variable is has a one value. So if it's less than zero, then print out this, okay? All right, so let's run the program. All right, as you can see that, that there's nothing has been executed in a while loop. The reason why is because the condition is checked first. So the condition is if count is less than zero, which is not, because it's one, so it is not going to execute anything, all right? But in the same thing, in do while loop, x is equal to one, and I'm going to say do system out print x value if it is less than zero. Well, because this compiler comes up here first, it actually prints out the value of one and then check the condition. So even the condition is false, it is still going to print out x value. So that's the difference between while loop and do while loop. While loop checks the condition first and do while loop checks the condition at last. All right, so that was a quick tutorial about do while loop. Next video is going to be about for loop, right? So thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. If you have any questions, leave it in the comments. 
and don't forget to subscribe thanks for watching talk to you guys in the next video what's going on this is always back with another video of java essential training series so in this video we're going to discuss for loop so what are the for loop basically so for for loop it's one of the looping statement in java programming for loop is used to execute the set of statement repeatedly until the condition is true for loop checks the condition and execute the set of statement it is loop control statement in java so what is the syntax for for loop so the for loop contains the following statements such as initialization, condition, and increment and decrement statement. So let me give you an example. Okay. So I have explained while loop and do while loop in the previous video. I have the same code here. So I will explain what's the difference between for loop, do while, and while loop, right? So let me start a for loop here. So you start for loop with the word for and then you add parentheses okay so first is the initialization which is going to be that int x is equal to one that's a variable with the data type of int so in do while loop and while loop you have to declare that outside the loop but in for loop you can declare inside which is called initialization so i'll type int let's say x is equal to zero okay so that's the initialization basically declaring a variable with a data type and then semicolon that will separate it from condition now so the condition we're going to do is x less than let's say five okay and then semicolon which is going to separate it from increment or decrement okay so i'm going to say x plus plus that's going to be increment operator and then get out from the parentheses now enter and add a code block for for loop that's a curly braces very simple and then i'm going to um, print out x values onto the console right so here i'm going to say in a in a double code that's count x value is okay equal to and then use your concatenation operator which is a plus sign and then just type x okay and now let's run the program all right so as you can see the x value is 0 1 2 3 4 so basically it's the same thing indexing start from 0 to onwards so the first value is going to be 0 1 and let's say i'll type 2 okay and then run so it's going to do two three fives okay so that's how you can define for loop all right so there are three types of for loops a simple for loop what i've just shown you and for each loop or enhanced for loop what i give you an example which is using array and a labeled for loop okay so let's look at the enhanced for loop which is going to be an array so let's go and let me just move it down and I'm going to start with integer array. I'm going to name it array. And then you can do with double uh, square brackets or you can just um, define those square brackets next to the data type. It's the same thing. There's a different ways of um, declaring array. If you wanna know about array, watch my understanding array video. It's equal to, and I'm going to use curly braces, okay? So I'm going to say one, comma two comma three comma four comma five comma six comma seven comma eight comma nine and that's it okay end of the curly braces and you use a semicolon okay to finish the array so that's the array now okay so now what i'm going to do i'm going to use that array in a for loop so let's get rid of this code here all right and let's get rid of this code okay so to access that array in a for loop i'm going to define our initializer int let's say numbers right and i would say that is equal to zero i'm going to add semicolon and then there's a condition and then i'm going to say numbers less than five okay and then semicolon again and then numbers plus plus that's an increment operator 
Okay, so next we're going to add uh, a code block which is already there and then system.printout. Okay, so to print out that array in a for loop, what you do is type the array name, sorry, array, and then you add square brackets and then you type the numbers which is the uh, for loop initializer that is a number is equal to zero right okay so let's uh, run the program now all right as you can see that we got one two three four five values because number is less than five and there you go we got one two three four five let me change this okay let's say five let's say six oops six let's say eight okay so now what we'll get let's run the program now on the zero index we got five six three eight five right so that's how you can uh, access array in for loop but let me give you another uh, way to access that okay so i'm gonna get rid of this code here okay and let's get rid of uh, this code here as well okay so you can simply do int okay and make a initializer let's say numbers again okay and then colon and then array name so which is array that's fine and then in the system out of print line statement all you have to do is type the initializer okay so let's print it out so you've got whole array it's been printed so that's how you can use array and access the array in for loop all right so there's another loop here infinite loop so that's just a let's say if i type four and then i'll two columns add a code block oops and fill the braces okay so here s out and i will try whatever all right so now let's see it's an infinite loop so it's gonna keep running keep running keep running keep running so you have to stop it that's a different way to that's just the infinite loop. if there's nothing in there that's going to be infinite loop so that was a like better way to access the array in for loop all right so that was about for loop guys thanks for watching and if you have any questions let me know in the comments below you can follow me on Twitter at OASMIZA01 and don't forget to subscribe and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. What's going on everybody? My name is Oasis and I welcome you to another part of the Java Central Training Series. So this video is going to be about syntax error and logical errors and then we're going to look at the debugging feature in IntelliJ IDEA. So first, let me show you the syntax errors. So what are the syntax errors basically? The syntax errors are the errors which base if you don't follow the proper syntax of the language, let's say I'm using Java here, right? So Java wants me to put semicolon at the end when I um, declare my integer val um, variables, right? So if I remove that, and there's a syntax to um, write down string in system.out.println statement so I'll remove that as well so now it basically turned to red so when I run my program now it actually is going to tell me what are the errors available in my program so those are basically called syntax errors right so if you go down here so you've got one error on line 8 8 and then there you go that's the error so we are missing unclosed string literals so now I can go to line 8 here and then I can just put double quotes there so that's going to be fixed all right so the next error we have on line 10 so there's a line 10 here and then I'm missing semicolon okay so I'm going to put semicolon there and that's going to be fixed as well so you can look at down here the messages you get from IntelliJ IDEA so the most um, imp um, from a uh, famous um, IDE for Java such as NetBeans, uh, Eclipse and IntelliJ, they all have this feature. So just look around and then find out what are the errors around there. So these are the syntax errors. So let me give you an example of a logical error now. So I'm going to get rid of this program. Okay. All right, so I'm going to get rid of this program now. And let's um, 
say I will define few variables here. So I'm going to define integer variables x and y. Okay, and then I come down here. I will give x is equal to five semicolon, and I will give y is equal to zero. All right, so we got that. Now I'm going to define another variable. I'm going to say result is equal to x. We need to use the parentheses. So x divided by y. All right, and I'm going to put semicolon and I'm going to print it out to the console. So here is going to be a result. All right, so if I run this program now, there's going to be an error. And I will explain to you guys. Okay. All right. So we have the error now. So it's telling you that exception in thread main class Java dot lang and then blah 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 divided by zero. So if you know a little bit of math, you guys know that integer value cannot be divided to zero. Okay. Cannot be divided by zero. So that's a logical error. So it's a good idea when you make any logic in your program, make sure you run that before going further. Um, so you know that this logic is 100% right. So these uh, kind of errors are called logical errors. Okay. So let me go and fix this. If I change the value to, let's say six. All right. So let's run the program now. Now I'm going to get a result which is zero now it is going to divide but um, because uh, I'm not using as a double let's say if I change this to double now it's going to give us some result all right still an error because it cannot be divided a double cannot be divided this right so that kind of errors are uh, logical errors right so let me go and change this back to integer and then down here I will change the operation from division to plus okay so let's run the program should be fine the answer should be 11 okay so now I'm going to show you how to use a debugging feature in IntelliJ IDEA okay so uh, we have these line numbers here right so if you don't know you can go up here and then click on show line numbers okay so i'm gonna show i've got another video in this which i've shown you guys how to turn them on if you don't see them in intelligy idea okay so now i'm going to debug the program instead of running it so let's debug this program okay so now as you can see that i've got uh, this debug menu open for me right so if i go to debugger here okay and then it will debug the program and it's telling me that frames not available to use this debugging feature what it does for us is basically it let us execute every statement step by step so you know what's going on with your program so to do that you need to add breakpoints to add breakpoints just click on the next uh to the next number so let's say if i want to add a breakpoint so just click next to eight so it's going to add a breakpoint to eight make another breakpoint here okay and now let's go and debug the program. All right, so now we got another, uh, that program basically didn't debug, it stopped here on the first breakpoint. So it's, as you can see that, that line has been um, changed to pinkish color. So let's go to the debugger now. Here we got another kind of menu here. So the first is going to be step over, step into, force step into and we got the shortcut keys for them as well so step out right so here now i can see that i've got a variable x which has five integer value y is equal to six integer value and result is 11 okay so now the program has been come here but i'm going to get rid of this breakpoint and now let's debug the program again all right so we got here all right, let's debug the program again. Then click here. It's still giving us the thing, but I'm going to add a breakpoint here. Okay, let's debug it again. All right, so now we have this um, method there. Now I'm going to click on a step into. Okay, now it's going to show the next variable x is equal to five. And then next line, is going to be executed y is equal to six. So if I click on step into, and then next variable you can see is six. The next is a result, that statement. 
So you got few information about those statements here as well. You gotta find out. Just read through and you will find out what are these. So, so the next statement. So basically debugging lets you um, scroll through your program step by step. So each statement will be run step by step. You need to click on step into, right? If you're gonna go step out, you can go step out, right? All right, so that was a quick tutorial about uh, syntax errors and logical errors and how to use a debugging feature in IntelliJ IDEA and to add breakpoints. So it's very simple. Just click on um, add breakpoints. So if I just click here, the numbers will go away. Right click, show line numbers. That simple. Okay, so thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you have any questions, let me know in the comments below. And don't forget to give me a feedback of these tutorials so I know that I'm doing uh, good or I'm doing bad. Uh, you guys understanding what I'm teaching here. So thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Chase. What's going on? This is always back with another video of Java Central Training Series. So in this video, I'm going to give you an introduction of method. So what is a method basically? So there is a class, public class main, and we have a method down here, public static wide main. That's a method in Java. In other languages, it can be called functions, but here usually um, called a method. So um, we can define our own methods as well, what I'll show you in a second. But let me explain to you what is a method. So public, that's a keyword. That means that this method is available to entire application, right? Static is a keyword and the wide means that this method does not return any value. Main is a method name and these are the parameters of the method. So every Java program has a main class with a capital M and a main method that is compulsory without the main method you cannot run a program you cannot even design a program let me give you an example how to create your own method right so i've just mentioned that the name main can only be named once in any program so let's create our own method now so i'm just going to press enter here all right so i'm going to create my own method I'm going to name it public which is going to be available to entire application and then the word static right and then wide which means that this method doesn't return any value and then comes the method name so I would say that my method okay and then and then we need to um, add parentheses all right so basically the parameters goes in those parentheses for this example i'm just going to leave them empty all right and then i'm going to press enter or you can start your code lock right there okay so in that method let's say i will write s out okay and i'll say this is my first method okay all right so we got that now so we can retrieve that system that out in our main method so basically compiler reads the main method first right so we can access the other method which we just made called my method and it has the statement of system dot out dot print line and string value which is this is my first method in a double quotes so i can print it out as many times as i want so let's go back to our main method now and here i'm going to type my method that's it that's all you have to do just type the name of the method right with the parentheses and semicolon at the end right let's debug this program now and let's look at the output all right so as you can see that we got the result this is my first method let's run that one more time so this is my first method so let's say i can just copy and let's say paste 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 right so instead of writing out this statement now all i have to do is just write the method name which is going to execute this statement it's going to retrieve the system.out.println from the my method 
and then it's going to print out as you can see that so you can create a different kinds of methods such as you can add two values and you won't use that um, those values and many times in the program so instead of um, writing that code again and again you can create a method and just retrieve that method which is really really uh, which is gonna help your program to be a bit smaller alright so let me give you a quick example of creating a method so let's create another method here I'm going to public static and void right and then let's say hello okay and then I'm going to pass a value inside and it says string okay and then I'm going to the next parameter is going to be name okay so I'm going to type name done and then add a code block there and then let's say system dot out okay and then now I'm going to type hello and I'm going to add a concatenation here and type the parameter what we just defined in the hello method okay so we got that method now right let's go back to our main method here if I use um, hello method okay and now I can pass in a value here the string we defined here the argument here name so I can use that here okay so the here I will type the value for that so in the double quotes I will say always right and then that's it so I'll use the same method okay and here I'll say let's say Alex okay right use that method again and say let's say John or David okay and let's print it out so the result is going to be hello ways hello Alex hello David so now I'm only printing out um, hello the method basically it's going to call this method and then the statement we have in there is the word hello okay and then the name right so the name is going to be the value of that string alright so that was a quick example for uh, string values let's look at the addition here okay and then we'll jump into the bit more um, advanced um, method here so I'll show you the predefined method as well okay so now I'm going to add another method alright so I'm going to type public static okay and wide okay and now I'm going to type add let's say addition addition alright so in the parameters are arguments now instead of giving a string values I'm going to type integer x comma integer y okay and then comma integer z okay and then add a code block right so instead of giving a string values the one we used before now I'm making addition method with three integer variables okay so with those parameters or arguments now I'm going to use system dot out and I'm going to say addition of these three numbers okay and I'm going to say plus okay now let's say add another parenthesis and say x plus y plus z right all right so now we have that now I'm going to use that method in the main method now so how do we do that now all right so let's go to the main uh, method now I'm going to start with the method name what I'm going to use right so addition okay so if I just type let's say a okay here that's a method so you see that IntelliJ idea can tell you that's a method right so method has x value y and z these three integers so you can type with the comma three values and then the main method with the addition method it will read from that method now okay so let's add that method now all right here 
I'm going to add let's say 10 comma 5 comma 10 all right so we have given uh, three values all right so I have three variables here there are three values here right and that's our operation here let's run the code and see what we get so addition of these three numbers 25 you could use the scanner class with that I'll show you in a second all right so let's talk about this white keyword that means that this method would not return any value okay so let's say if I change this void to int okay and now if I come down here I will see this red bulb okay so make addition return value because that method is not void now it has to return a value which has to be integer now because I've used integer I could use double, I could use float, I could use long, right? So whatever the data type is there for that method, that fun method has to return that value, all right? So let's say integer, right? Okay, so now, instead of writing this statement now, what I can do here, I'm just going to change that to a comment, all right? And now, I'm going to add a return value here so let's go to the end enter so return okay and now I'm going to type x plus y plus z with the semicolon right so now basically these are these three are integer values here all right that's why we are returning this expression so x plus y plus z right let's look at how we use these values now all right so here in the main method now I'm going to uh, declare another integer variable and I'm going to say sum okay is equal to and now I can use this method right so that's the name of the method right so I'll type addition right and then I will type three values because it this method can take three integer values so x y z right so I said 10 comma 5 comma 10 as you can see down there it will tell you that right now you are entering because as you can see that the z integer variable is a bit darker than these two so you can see that this is the value we are uh, declaring right now all right so there semicolon at the end right so you have um, added this method to these values now okay with that help of this addition keyword right so how do we print out the result come down here type sl right and then type sum okay so we're gonna use this variable now because that variable is basically equal to this so we can use that variable now so let's run the program the result should be 25 so all right so now i'm going to give you a bit more complicated program and we'll make our own method now so let's get rid of this thing here all right so to make that program right i need to import a scanner class right so if you don't know about these classes uh, watch my a video on predefined functions or predefined method I think it's the previous video or two videos before this video I'm gonna upload so watch that right all right so let's import java.util.scanner right so what it does basically it lets you put values from the console all right so now let's go to the main method right so in the main method I will declare a few variables all right but before declaring the variables we're going to make a new method here so let's go and make public static and I'm going to use a double keyword now because it's going to return a double value all right so I'm going to type a average okay and then I'm going to in the parameters I'm going to declare three a double variable so double right and say num1 okay 
double is a data type num two right so another one double and space num three okay so these are the three variables we have in this average method which is going to return a double value let's add a code block now all right so we've got the code block there so now i'm going to say that double okay avg that's going to be another variable is equal to okay i'm going to add these three values and i'm going to divide them by three to get the average of that all right so now let's uh, num so because i'm dividing so i need to um, declare it in that parenthesis so add the parenthesis now so num1 plus num2 plus num3 okay num3 well i've missed they made a mistake here so i need to change this to num3 and here i can do num3 okay and then outside the parenthesis forward slash for division type 3 and semicolon all right press enter and now there is a red line under this course right so it's saying a missing return statement okay so type return and what it's going to return right you give me uh, give a guess right this is going to return a double value so this is the avg variable we declare that's what it's going to return because it's a double it's not give, going to give us error so avg semicolon let me give you an example if i change this to int okay and now the whole code is not right so it's telling me that required int found double right so we have to change that to double right okay so that's the say double okay all right so we got this uh, method there now we're going to use that method in our main method all right so let's declare three variables now double variables right so x comma y comma z right with the semicolon at the end okay and declare another variable double Oops, one keep writing do double a v g okay well let me explain to you that double a v g value is different than so this variable only exists in these parentheses right so this is another uh, matter which is um, going to stay in this matter right that a v g is going to stay in this matter okay so every variable belongs to its own method press enter here and now we need to create a scanner class right to put the values to these double variables i need to create a scanner class because i don't want to um, declare the variables here i want to put them on the console so let's declare a scanner class scanner right and then say in okay let's name it input is equal to new scanner okay and then say system dot in okay so that's our scanner is being created now right so now i'm going to say that s out and i'm going to type enter three numbers okay and then i'm going to press enter again and now let's um, after that message will pop up to the console i need to prompt the user for input right so let's say x is equal to i'm going to use scanner class which is input right that's what we created before right if you don't know about scanner class watch my video on um, getting input from user that in that video i'll explain everything about it all right so next input so next dot double right because we're getting a double variable all right that's a double data type there and then semicolon same with the y is equal to input not next dot double z is equal to input dot next dot double okay right so we got three variables we are getting from user 
and down here I can use the AVG variable now average variable right so it's equal to now I need to use that method down here okay so I want to use this method apply to these values what I get from user on the console so let's start the average method name and now we need to declare three variables so instead of giving a numeric ver uh, values I can use these variables the values I will get from console so let's give x comma y comma z right and then a semicolon all right all right so then we're going to say system dot out dot print line I'm going to say the average is okay actually put equal to sign to make it more with professional concatenation operator which is a plus operator and then a variable which is avg right so we're going to print out this variable all right so that was a bit of complicated program uh, to creating a method and using them so let's run the program now all right so it's telling me to enter three numbers on three enter three and three enter so the average is 3.0 okay let's run the program again and let's say 9 enter 9 enter 9 so the average should be 9 right so, all right so that was um, about a method I hope you understood what I want to say and if you have any question leave that in the comments below and you can follow me on Twitter at awaysmizzle01 I can reply to you straight away from Twitter so if you want to contact me make sure you contact me on Twitter alright thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video and don't forget to subscribe chase hey everybody my name is Awais and I welcome you to another video of Java essential training series so this video is going to be about predefined functions in Java so the Java API or you can call it application programming interface is a collection of software packages that programmers can use for graphics, user interface, and networking, sound, database, math, and much more. It contains many methods that have already been written and tested. So in order to use these specific methods in our programs, we have to import the necessary libraries by adding them to our program. So let's start by importing a random class. So I'm gonna get rid of this uh, scanner class and let's import the random class. So import java.util random. Okay, well you need to use a capital R. All right, so with the semicolon. All right, so I've created a random number project now and um, I'm going to import the random class, which I did just. The random class is a part of the Java util library. By combining these libraries and now into loops, we can start to write a program simulation. So how about if we simulate a rolling two dice 100 times and count how many times we roll doubles. So in this program, we will use a random number generator to help with our simulation. So we'll need to count how many times we roll double. So let's start by adding some variables. So let's go and I'm going to declare two integer variables. Let's say int die one die two. Okay, so I need another variable here count doubles, so which is going to count doubles for us. All right, so we got well, let's give this a value of zero for now, right? Okay, so we've got that. Now we need to create a random number generator. So use a random class, type random. I'm going to name that rand is equal to, new is a keyword, random again. And then here, I'll leave that empty, okay? Because we're not using right now anything. All right, so now if you guys can guess that what kind of loop we need to use to roll two dices for 100 times. All right, so let's do that. So I'm going to use for loop. If you guess for loop, that's your right. And then I'm going to use initializer. So let's say integer i is equal to zero, okay? And semicolon, and for the condition, I'm going to say i less than 100, okay? And then we need to increment i. So i plus plus, 
right and then semicolon or oh, sorry we don't need the semicolon and then I'm gonna add the code block here so to add the code block in the code block I'm going to give values to my integer variable so let's say die one is equal to so I've used that random number generator that's what I'm going to use now so I'm going to say ran dot next int semicolon okay and then I'm going to say die two is equal to rand next dot int all right so here we haven't declared any parameters in our parentheses yet so all right i'll explain to you guys in a second but let's finish the program first so i need a if statement here so i would say if die one is equal to die two okay what it should do i'm going to add another code block here so it should count doubles okay and right now count double has a zero value right so now we need to increment that so i'm going to plus plus that's the increment operator semicolon right so if die one is equal to die two that's what it's going to do it's going to count double and it's going to store that one digit to this and then it's going to keep incrementing as long as we get a die one is equal to die two all right so now let me show you one more thing here we haven't declared that how many numbers are in die one or in die two so the die is basically having one to six numbers right so i'm going to type six here okay and then six down here right but as you guys know that the indexing start from zero so if i type six here it's only going to add zero to five so we're going to miss number six on the die to fix that problem i have to add one to each of these statements right so now we're going to get a variable um, we're going to get values from one to six all right all right so let's print it out let's get out of the for loop first and say system out and then on print line i'm going to add a double quotation and i'm going to say i rolled okay and let's finish the double quotation and use the concatenation operator which is a plus operator and then print out count doubles use the concatenation again add quotation and then say doubles okay all right so we have uh, this okay so let me debug this program and let's see what result do we get Okay, so we rolled 15 doubles in hundreds, right? So if I run that program again, the answer should be different each time. So now as you can see that it's 18. Let's run it again, it's 14. So that's how you can use a random class to generate a random numbers, okay? Which is really useful uh, for uh, the game development later on, I'll, making, I'll be making more videos, um, tutorial videos so that was about it how to use classes and which are predefined by java so just let me show you a quick thing here i'm going to use my edge browser and i want to show you where you can find those classes so if you type on bing or on google just type java documentation okay so let's click on that one's fine the first link you get all right so this is a java documentation so if i go let me just increase the size so you guys go look at it all right so if i click on the package java.util i need to find that somewhere here okay that's a java.util right so in that package i will have a classes should be a random number so if i click on random so these are the details of a random class here how to use them what are the methods and what are the parameters available for this um, class so you can just uh, read through and you can find out how to use them so let's say we've got few methods here such as um, boolean void double float so these are all the methods can be used with the random class all right so thanks for watching guys don't forget to subscribe and i'll talk to you guys in the next video guys what's going on this is always back with another video of java central training series so this video is going to be about overloading functions. 
So two or more methods may have the same name as long as the list of parameters of the return type is different. So when this happens, it's called overloading functions. For example, if you want to write a method that finds the average of three numbers, you might want to allow it to use three integers or three doubles. The logic is the same, but the type of data sent by calling program is different. So let's take a look. Let's start by adding a method that takes three integer parameters and my method is going to be public static. So type public static and then the first method I'm going to double, right? So it's going to return a double value. And I'm going to name it average. Okay, parentheses. And in the parentheses, I'm going to declare three variables. So int x, int y, int z, right? And then press enter, add a code block. So in the code block, all I have to do is return x plus y, oops, I missed the plus sign, y plus z. All right, so now I am returning a double value. So I have to divide it by 3.0. So that's called, that's called implicit conversion. So it's going to add the values of three integers and then divide it by 3.0. So that's called implicit conversion, right? So I'm going to press semicolon and now let's add another method here. So public static and now I'm going to return double value average. As you can see that I'm naming it the same average. Okay. So now instead of integer variables, I'm going to declare double x comma double y comma double z All right I press enter add a code block all right so now i'm going to return a double average so return okay and then in the parentheses you type x plus y plus z all right and now if i want to divide it by three to get the average I don't have to write that decimal point. As you can see that here we did a decimal point. So that's called implicit conversion. And here, because I've got a double variables for these x, y, and z, so I don't have to write a 3.0. So I would just say divided by three because they already double values, okay? So now let's go up to the main function and let's print out, All right? So I'm going to use print line s out and the average of three integers okay is some colon space and then i'm going to use a concatenation operator average okay so make sure that i'm using integers all right so here i have to give the values now so i would say let's say three comma now the y value is going to be five comma z value we can give it let's say nine all right so and then get out of the math uh this statement and then write another s out print line statement okay so i'm going to say the average of three doubles is and then add a concatenation operator right so average okay so as you can see that we got two methods here with the same name but one method is integer where it has integer parameters and double parameters so i'm going to use a double one this time right okay and then here i will give a value of let's say 4.0 comma 5.9 all right comma let's say 6.5 right so here because i am using that double average method which has the double parameters of variable type all right so that's why i have to use 4.0 i have to use that decimal point all right so now let's go and run the program all right so we got that the average of three integers is 5.66 so as you can see that because i'm using implicit conversion here with 3.0 it automatically return the value in a decimal point right and then here we already have the deci uh, double variables that's why we got for 5.4 answer 
Okay, you could do this um, here. I could use the formatter as well if I want to. So let's say F, okay. And I want to use the modifier. So I'll just give, let's say, percentage sign, okay. And then I'll say 5.2, 5 to the left and then 2 to the right. And then let's, and to uh, use the formatter F, all right, because it's a floor. So let's run the program. So it's going to give us only two values on the right now. Okay, there is an error now. The reason why, because instead of using this plus operator, I have to use comma now. Let's run the program again. There you go. So we got 5.47 for doubles. And let's change the values here. Let's say uh, to change this, I'll just make a bit bigger value. All right, so as you can see that we got different values. So with the decimal point, this is with the decimal. So that's called overloading functions. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Don't forget to subscribe. Hey guys, what's going on? This is always back with another video of Java Essential Training Series. So this video is going to be about creating classes. And I want to mention that from this video onwards, we're going to discuss the object-oriented side of Java. So classes are critical components of all object-oriented programming languages. The class is a blueprint for an object. The classes are used to represent the state and behavior of the real-world object, such as a person, a bank account, a vehicle. All classes contain instance data constructors, which are special methods used to build an instance of our class and method. The block of code common to all objects of this class that represent the object's behavior. So you might be asking why classes? Well, classes are reusable. Multiple programs can use the same class. Classes also allow us to encapsulate data. That means to protect the data, to help enforce data integrity. Data is defined as private inside the class and data is then assessed using get and set methods, which are otherwise known as accessor and mediator method. I think it's time for an example. To create a class in IntelliJ IDEA, you can go to File menu, New, and then Java class. There's another way you can do that. Make sure that you're in the packages, okay? Usually it's in the project, so change that to packages. And then in your package, right click and you get the same menu, Java class. All right, so I'm going to click on it and I'm going to name it my class. Let's. So the class name always start with a capital letter. Okay, so click OK. And on the top, you can see that I have this class created by Weiss Mirza. All right, so I'm going to add some variables with the data in it and then we will learn how to access this class in our main class. So let's go back to my class and add some details to our class. So let's say I want to create a class about my details. All right. So let's say I study in a school. So I have a role number. I have the name and I have uh, age and a few more information about myself, right? So I'm going to create a class now. Let's say I will declare another variable. So let's say int, okay? And then I'm going to name it, let's say, it's id, okay, semicolon. And let's declare a variable for my name. So I'll use string, okay? And then let's say name, okay? And then I will use my, um, let's say, a few information about myself. Let's say my age, so int, age, okay. And then another string variable which has a few information about myself, okay. So let's say bio, okay. So I have four variables here in this class. To access this class in my main class, so let's go to our main.java class, okay. So here to access that, I need to create an object with that class. Okay, so to create an object, all you have to do is just use the name of the class. So let's say my class 
IntelliJ idea will tell you there's a class my class is available right so I'm just gonna click on it and then I'm going to name my object let's say my info info is equal to new is a keyword and then again the name of the class okay so my class and then semicolon in those parentheses I could pass arguments or parameters but for now I'm gonna just leave them empty right we'll discuss that in a second let's press enter now okay to access that object now and that class let's say I will type my info okay and press a decimal point right once you press decimal point any IDM let's say IntelliJ IDEA NetBeans or Eclipse will give you some option so in that my info object or you can call it instant as well we have three variables age bio ID and name so I'm going to use ID first right and I'm going to say is equal to let's say 10 okay and semicolon and then I'm going to access that object again my info dot name all right and is equal to and this is a string variable so that's why I have to use a double codes and I'll just type my name always Mirza right and then semicolon at then and then my info dot age so I'll type is equal to 28 semicolon that's because it's an integer variable there right and then my info dot bio right so that's a string there is equal to and let's say I am a programmer and of I don't know but let's say just I'm a programmer that's fine okay and then semicolon at then right so now to print out those details I will type as out right and then the name of the variable now so I'm using mine for that ID so now I will say my info dot again I get four options because in that my class I have four variables declared so you can see the type of that variable as well so int string int and string okay so now I'm going to type ID okay and then I'm going to say plus for concatenation and let's say my info and then dot name okay and then plus and then my info dot age and then and again contact concatenation operator my info dot bio all right so now if I run this program it's going to print out these values as you can see that 10 Oasis Mirza 28 I'm a programmer a class can be used to create as many object as you want so I'm going to go and create another object all right so let's say I will add uh, some details of my brother now so let's say I'll say my class okay and I will try my brother's name as fun is equal to new okay and then my class the class name and then that's our object now so I'm just gonna write it this is called an object or instance all right so we can use the same class with that object and print out some more details so let's say I will say asfund dot okay so now when I type decimal object I get age bio name equals to our ID so I mean ID is equal to let's say 11 all right and then asfund So if I go and print this out again so as out and then I will say asfund.id right plus operator which is a concatenation operator again asfund all right so dot name plus asfund.age okay plus operator 
asvind.bio. Okay, so let's print this out now. Run the program. So you see 11 is ID id aspen mirza 23 is a model okay guys so now let's talk about the constructors so if i go to my class.java as you can see that in this class i don't have any method but instead of method i'm going to create a constructor here to access this data to my main.java so we're going to start creating a constructor so type a keyword public and then type the name of the constructor so I'm going to keep this the same name so I'm going to say my class okay that's going to be a constructor and then I'm going to add a parenthesis here and here I'm going to declare a variables right so I'm going to int id comma that's a string string name comma int age comma string bio right and then I'm going to add a code block two curly braces all right so now I'm going to use another keyword to indicate that I'm referencing to these variables and not these values okay so that is this so type this dot and then when you press dot IntelliJ idea give you some um, examples such as I have ID here name bio age right so I'm going to say id okay is equal to id right so as you can see that when I type id that indicates that I'm accessing this value now so we're gonna do the same thing with uh, every variable so I'm gonna say this dot string sorry this dot name okay is equal to name all right and then this dot age okay so that's the variable we have in the class so I'm going to select that is equal to age then this dot bio okay when I press enter as you can see that these two things highlighting so I'm accessing this variable now is equal to bio right okay so we got the uh, variables here now I'm going to create another constructor down here to print out the values, right? So I'm going to say public, right? And then this is going to be string, so select string. And I'm going to use a method to string, okay? With parentheses, and I'm going to add a code block here, right? And then here I'm going to return a value. So I'm going to say return, okay? And then say in a um, in quotations you can type my ID okay ID and then I'm going to get out of the quotation and then as a add a concatenation with the plus operator and then say ID okay so now I'm accessing this variable okay and then I'm going to add another concatenation and add a quotation and here I'm going to use a modifier so I'm going to slash and this is going to create a new line for us okay all right so here I'm going to say my name is and then space get out of the quotation concatenation again and then type name okay concatenation again and quotation again and then say this is my age okay get out of the concatenation add concatenation and then I'm going to use age variable right plus quotation again and then I'm going to say this is my bio okay enter add a concatenation here and then I'm going to say bio okay and then add a, com a semicolon right so I'm just going to press let's say enter here so we can just get that in two lines to readable to make it readable all right so this is our constructor now all right so let's go back to main.java now and here um as you can see that there's a line here a red line so it's telling me that i need integer string integer and string right so first let's make this code a comment so it doesn't go through the compiler 
All right, let's come down here and finish the comment. Just going to press enter, strike and forward slash. All right, so now if I hover over my cursor here, as you can see that I need integer, string, integer and string. Okay, so I would say my ID is 10, comma, and then I'm going to add a string value here. So my name is going to be always, okay? And then add a comma here and then say, I'm 28 for the age and then another string so here I can say I am a programmer okay so now to print it out to the console just uh, say system dot out dot print line and then I'm going to use that my class sorry my info here all right so type my info okay and then decimal point and use that two string method because the two string method is the method in a my class which is returning this value all right so i'm going to use that method with this data let's run the program and we should get the result all right so it says my id my name is always this is my age 28 and this is the bio all right so here you can type let's say and and then you can say and here to break the line to go to the next line basically and let's see All right so my age is 10 my name is always this is my age and this is my bio and I'm a programmer you can create multiple objects to use that my class Java let me show you another one alright so let's say I will give my class okay and then say let's say as as fund info okay is equal to new my class and then here i can pass to those values as well so let's say i'll say his id is 11 comma his name is which is going to be string as fund okay and let's add next line here and after the name all right so next add a another one here by using comma and he is 23 then comma again and then I'm going to add quotation and and let's say I'm a programmer well he's a model so he's a model all right so add the same column and then to read that out as well so system that out the same thing we did before so I'm going to say as fund info dot two string method let's run this program now okay so we have the both values here my id blah 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 my name is aspen this is my age and so you can create a multiple objects and use that class now so that's it for this video guys i hope you like it and if you find this information useful then share it with your friends and don't forget to subscribe all right so and you can follow me on Twitter at AwaysMizza01. And if there is any question, leave that in the comments below. Thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. Hey guys, what's going on? This is Awais back with another video of Java Essential Training Series. So far, I've done 25 videos on this course. So Java is object-oriented programming language. But in those 25 videos, I've discussed the uh, basics of Java and from now onwards this video i'll be talking about the object oriented side of java so what is an object oriented language the most popular programming language were developed in the last 30 years were all object oriented programming languages so i'm going to give you a brief history when we started using object oriented languages and why we needed them before object oriented languages there used to be a procedural straight languages like photon or cobol they used to be a a big chunk of code in the same place they used to have a lot of variables all the codes at one place right it was quite hard to maintain those programs to design those programs and that's why the object oriented design or object oriented concept gained popularity it was around 80s so nowadays if you want to develop a program for a windows platform or 
you know, for a, a Mac platform or you want to develop a Android games or Android application, you need to use object oriented languages such as Java, C++, Ruby on Rails and Python. The object oriented language is not a language itself. It's a it's an idea which is supported by uh, many languages. So now we're going to talk about the core concepts of object oriented programming. So in object oriented programming, we have objects, classes, a concept of abstraction and uh, encapsulation and polyformism, right? Um, I'll make a, a separate video for each of these topic and I will explain them in details. But in this video, I'll give you a quick introduction. What are these? So let's talk about an object. So what is an object in programming language, of course? Uh, but let me ask you a question. What is an object in the real life? Uh, I've got this uh, noise filter here. Is it an object in real life? Yes, this is an object. I've got my glasses here. This is an object as well. And I've got a mouse. This is an object. All right, so I've got a Coke can as well. So in the real world, every object have attributes, behavior, and identity. I've got a separate um, a Coca-Cola can here. Of course, they're the same, but they are not one object. They are separate object. They have a different identity. This can can be filled or can be uh, empty, right? So that's the attribute of this, and that could be just sealed. The attributes to the objects are specific to those objects, all right? They belong to them. So I mean, telephone cannot fly or aircraft cannot ring, all right? So the same in um, Java programming, object-oriented programming, we have objects, but we take them a bit further. Uh, in programming language, of course, we can call this an object. I can take my name and make it an object, right? But in the real world, we usually call objects what we can see. Let's say I can see this, right? So this is an object to me. But in programming, we can declare those things as an object which uh, we can't see, which basically, let's say a bank account can be an object. Uh, a name can be an object, a date, a time can be an object. So that's the difference between, and in programming language, of course, they have their attributes, they have their behaviors. So we'll discuss them in details. All right, so now let's talk about the classes. Classes and objects can go hand to hand, right? We cannot skip classes and talk about objects. They both, uh, basically the classes are, I'm gonna give you an example, right? So when we go to school, uh, what do you say? What do we say? Like, oh, I'm gonna go to in class one or class two or class three. So what does class have? Class have an object such as a people or kids, right? Class have chairs, class have tables, right? So in the programming language, we create classes and then classes create an objects. Classes basically describe the type of the class, right? What is it? Is it an employee? Is it a bank account? Is that event, player, document, album? And then classes have the properties and data. We can call it attributes in a simple word. So what is it? Weight, height, color, score. Let's say it's a black color, right? So its attribute is the color black, right? And file type, health, length. So operations, we have a class operation as well. It's basically a behavior. So what can class do for us? Uh, can it play? Can it open a file? Search a file, save a file, edit a file, or print a file? So these are all, these three things make classes. I'm going to explain briefly about encapsulation concept in object-oriented programming language. So the word encapsulate is basically to cover something, right? So to protect something, let's say you've got an, uh, the program which uh, explains the bank account for someone, right? So you want to protect that, right? You want to encapsulate that. You want to show only that part which is necessarily required for other classes to use that, right? So that is basically called encapsulation. I'll do a separate video on encapsulation and I will explain them in details. Uh, but I will do another a programming example as well. So uh, follow the playlist as well. So, all right. So that was uh, about it. Uh, this video. I just wanted to give you a quick examples and uh, wanted to briefly explain about objects and classes and encapsulation. Uh, there are three more concepts I know, but I will explain them with examples in 
and intelligent ideas so stay tuned for that all right guys so thanks for watching if you find this information useful uh, share it with your friends you can follow me on twitter at awaysmusa01 and for now stay blessed hey guys what's going on this is always back with another video of java essential training series so this video is going to be about encapsulation. So in object-oriented programming language, you will often hear the term encapsulation. Encapsulation ensures data integrity and reusability. Encapsulation is one of the benefits of using object-oriented programming language. It allows the programmer to hide the definition of instance data and method from the user. This ensures that the data structures and operators are used as intended. Encapsulation can be described as protective barrier that prevents the code and data from being randomly accessed by other code. So I have a, this project here. I've got two classes, my class and the main class, right? So in my class, I've got the int id, string name, int age, and string bar. Right now, this data is accessed, uh, is available to the whole application, right? It's not hidden. We're not using encapsulation here. So I want to show you how you can uh, apply encapsulation and this is basically get and set method. So if you go to refractor in uh, IntelliJ IDEA, so we have an encapsulation field here. What it does is basically apply an encapsulation for us. So right now it's grayed out. What you have to do is select an ID or select any variable name and then go to refractor now you can see that field right so i'm gonna go and click on it all right so i've got the, all the variables available in this class i've got id i've got string name um, age int and bio string right so i'm gonna select all of them okay to apply the encapsulation here encapsulation tab you can check mark get access set access right and make them private let's refractor it and now as you can see that we've got all the ids keyword here a private all right and now down here we got the the encapsulation has been applied so we have public int get id and return is id so that's called uh, getters and setters and in other words you can call it encapsulation all right so my class dot java has been encapsulated we got a get id and set id method so these are getters and setters so to get the id from this class you need to use get id method to set the ID, set the value to this variable, you need to use the set ID method. So let me show you the get ID method first. So let's create an object here. So I'm going to uh, type my class, okay? And then I'm going to type my name as an object name is equal to new, which is a keyword, and then my class again. And in parentheses, I'm not going to pass any arguments because it's a simple program. Press enter. And down here, I need to print out the data from that class now. So I'll be using that object, which is away. So let's type uh, system out, okay? And then in the system out, I'll type the object name, okay? Dot. And now when I press dot, IntelliJ IDEA give me some suggestions here. So instead of just ID variable, I have get ID method now and set ID method now, right? So use that get ID now to print out on the same line use your encapsul uh, concatenation which is a plus operator then use the object name again dot get name right and then concatenation always right and then dot get age right and then i'm going to press enter and i'm going to concatenate down the line here always dot bio all right, so let's run this program. All right, as you can see that I've got that 11 OS, which is my name and 28 age, and then I'm a programmer, right? So let's go back here. So we got the same data here. So, all right, so let me show you how to set the values to those variables, okay? So here, to set the values now, I'm going to say always dot set id now. I'm going to set id, okay. And here I'm going to type let's say ten, right? And then come down here, 
ways dot set name I'm going to change the name to let's say John okay always dot set age let's make John 20 years old always dot set bio uh, I would say he is an object <laughs> all right whatever okay so we have set the values to those variables now let's print out so I'm going to say always dot get ID concatenation always dot get name right concatenation and always dot get age sorry get age not set age so where is it get age yep that's uh, fine here yeah. plus sign and then always dot get bio where is get bio okay get bio all right now let's go and run the program let's run it and uh, let's see what are the results we get so 10 john 20 he's an object right but in the main class we still got the same uh, data for those variables but here we can set the values for those variables all right so that's really cool okay so that was the encapsulation and set it together in simple words so you can set data and get data all right so thanks for watching guys and if you like this video give this video a thumbs up and share it with your friends uh, if anyone interested to learn in Java and thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. Hey guys, what's going on? This is always back with another video of Java Essential Training Series. So this video is going to be about constructors. Let me explain to you what are constructors in Java. Constructors in Java is a special type of method that is used to initialize object. Java constructor is invoked at a time of object creation. It constructs a value such as provide data for an object. That is why it is known as constructor. There are two rules for creating a constructor in Java. The first rule is the constructor name should be the same name as the class name. Such as if I create a constructor in my main class, the constructor name has to be a main. So constructor must have no return type. And there are two types of constructor in Java. Default constructor, parameterized constructor. So the first thing what we're going to look at is a default constructor. All right, so now we're going to create a class. You can create a class by going to file menu new java class right so i'm going to name it constructor okay i hope i spelled right all right so we have a class here called constructor in the class i'm going to declare a few variables let's say int x Let's go back to our main class to access this class and create an object from this class. So what we do, I'm going to type constructor, okay? And then let's say I'll name it average, okay? So AVR is fine, right? Is equal to new is a keyword and then constructor, right? A semicolon. All right, so now that thing here, let's say that thing here, right? that thing that's called a default constructor a java is uh, it's smart enough to create a constructor for us so if i go back here i don't see any constructor here but it's been created for us already so let's say uh, i will go and run the class main class which has nothing to execute right so let's say uh, i have this constructor here right this is a default constructor without any parameters 
So I'm going to go back to my constructor class and we're going to create that default constructor this time. So to create that, just type constructor as I told you guys that constructor name has to be same name of the class name. So this class name and constructor name should be the same. All right, and then it does not return, it can never return a return type like here. I'm returning that x, y, z multiplied by, multiply with each other and divide by three. It cannot return any type, right? So constructor name, add parentheses down here, add a code block, right? And then let's say this is a default constructor what we're using already to make our object, which is ABR, right? But let's say I'll come back here and I'll say system out, right? And let's say this is a constructor. Okay. All right. So now if I go back to my main class, as you can see, I haven't added any code yet. I'll run the class and guess what? It's going to execute that code. This is a constructor because we are using a default constructor in the default constructor now we have the value if i get rid of this constructor here it will still be there without any value inside so that's a default constructor in java so what is the purpose for default constructor in java default constructor provides a default value to the object like zero null etc depending on the type Alright, so now let's look at another way of uh, giving values to this constructor, right? So I'm going to type, let's say I will go x is equal to 10, y is equal to 10, z is equal to 10, right? So the answer should be 1000 because we will be using this method with that constructor. So let's go back to main.java. Here I'm going to create a new object. So to create an object, use that class name and object name, let's say average. So AVE is equal to new is a keyword and then constructor again. All right, so now come down to next line and then say system out, okay? So now I will use that object dot and if I press dot, you see that I have the uh, option of using that method now. So what will method do? We'll use these values from this constructor and um, process the data and give us the result. So now let's uh, just print it out. All right, so as you can see that we got 1000 as the returning value. All right, so now I'm going to use um, uh, a method of called constructor overloading. So what is a constructor overloading basically? So you can define a multiple constructors by use giving this um, a parameters. So let's say type constructor again in the parentheses. Now I'm going to type i for int is equal and that's going to be i and then say another int. So let's give a value of uh, let's say b okay and then int c right so we have three parameters in the constructor now all right and here in the constructor i'm going to use those variables x is equal to i and y is equal to b z c sorry z is equal to c all right so we have three values initialized with these values now so we have two constructor right now let me show you how to use them okay so we're using first constructor which is a default constructor has three values all right so come down to the next line here and type constructor so avg1 because you have to create a new object for that is equal to new constructor okay and now come down to the next line add a semicolon system out right and then say avg ave1 dot get average method right okay so we're using that method but uh, there's going to be an error because we're using the same uh, method twice with that object now so instead of leaving that empty now I can pass the values to these values now so let's say I will hover over my cursor here and I will type let's say 10 comma 10 comma 
10. Okay, all right, so now let's run the program. As you can see that the second result is 1000 as well because the second object is using the next constructor because it has the three parameters. Java compiler is smart enough to detect which constructor we are using. Okay, so that's called constructor overloading. You can create a m multiple constructors. I'll just give you a quick example of parameterized constructor, right? can see that zero John zero because there is no parameter here we only have two parameters in the first constructor that is why it's giving us a zero a null value all right so that's kind of a parameterized constructor which has parameters we'll talk about it while we make some projects in Java so for now thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video and don't forget to subscribe hey guys what's going on this is always back with another video of Java essential training series so this video is going to be about a steady keyword like we have a steady keyword here I've been using that steady keyword since the start of the series but in this video I'll explain what is mean by a steady keyword so the steady keyword in Java is used for memory management mainly we can apply Java steady keyword with variables method blocks and nested classes steady keywords belongs to the class then instance of the class static can be variable method block or nested class for example, static variable. If you declare any variable as static, it is known as static variable. A static variable can be used to refer the common properties of all objects, company name, employee, college, student, or any kind of variable you declare. A static variable gets memory only once in the class area at the time of the class loading. So what is the advantage of using static keyword? It makes your program more efficient. So now we're going to look at a very simple example and then I will make that program. I will explain what's the difference between using static keyword and without static keyword. All right. Now let's create a new class. So I'm going to go right click on my package Java class and I'm going to name it as keyword. Okay. Now we have our class um, start with S. S, okay, so in this class, I'm going to declare a method now. So I will try public wide, right? And let's say S T A keyword. Maybe name it same, it doesn't really matter. All right, so now here I will just say S out, okay? And then double quotation, I will say hi. Okay, 
So we have the method, but this is not a static method. So how do we call it in our main class? So I'll go back and to call the main uh, that method as keyword in the main class, we need to create an object. So I'll use as keyword obj is equal to new, and then I will type that as keyword again. And there you go. And now I can use that obj, right, dot as keyword. So as keyword basically is that method. And then we create an object with as keyword class. All right. So if I run this program, it will print out hi. All right. So we got the answer hi, right? So that's how you can access the class if it's not static. So let's say I will add static keyword to my method. Now this method directly belongs to this class, right? So now I can call that method without even declaring an object. So I will just get rid of this code first. All right. And yeah, so now let's call the class. So S keyword is a class dot. Okay. And then I can say S keyword. All right. So run the program. It is getting a bit confusing. Um, it's print high again, but let me go and change that the method name actually. So I'll type S word. Okay. I'll just start S word to make it more uh, easy for you guys. So now I have to change that here S word. Okay. So that's a class name and that's a method we are calling. And in that method, we have this S out statement, which is going to print high, right? So if I run the program, it will still print out high for us on the console. So uh, let me give you an, another uh, quick brief introduction to it. So if I get rid of this static keyword in my method, now this method cannot be called directly from the class. All right. Because that's the difference between static method and without static method. Right. So now we have to create an object and then we can use that object to call that method. Right. Let me show you one more time. So I'll say S keyword is a class name. And obj, we create an object, new, right, and then s keyword again. And now we can use that obj dot s word method, right? So in that method, we have this to print out. So it will print out the same. Let's change that to make it more easy for you guys. So let's, this is a non static method called with object. All right, so now let's go and run the program. And let's see what result we get. All right. So as you can see that static method can be called uh, directly from the class. And if it's not a static, you need to create an object. Let me give an example with the variable now. All right. So now I'm going to declare a few variables here. So let's say int id is equal to five. Okay. And I'll say string name is equal to let's say always all right all right so now in the method like right here in the method if i type let's say s out and i will say uh, id okay plus name okay all right so now we have that system printing out here so let's go back to our main class now there's an option here Okay, so let's go back to our main class now. Here, as you can see that my int id and string name is not static. I haven't added a static keyword before this int id, all right? So let's go back here. And then here, if I type my class name as keyword dot, and now I can only access class and lambda, lambda, lambda. all right? So I don't see any. So to access those variables now, what do we have to do is basically we have to create an object. So let's create an object as keyword. Let's say obj is equal to new as keyword, right? And then here I can use obj, right? Dot id, okay, id and name. I can use that. So is equal to, let's say five, okay? Five, because that's an integer Okay, so now I can print out that ID now with that five object. But let's say I will go back to my S keyword 
class and I will add static keyboard and next to it and then static static next to it right so now let's go back to our main class all right and here I've got an error now so if I hover over my cursor to ID it's telling me static member dot com dot example dot Java accessed via instance reference okay so the static method cannot be accessed by object so now what we have to do here I'm going to get rid of it all right and then I'm just gonna get rid of this object as well and let's say I'll use the class name as keyword dot and now I have ID and name can be accessed directly from the class so as ID okay and then just type as ID okay and you can type uh, let's say a method name now so ID is equal to you can type six okay and then I'll type as out and ID well you need to use that now so we're gonna do is basically it's setting a value to ID to six now in the other class we have five right so now basically you can access that and you can print it out so now we have to do s keyword dot id okay and then I will run the program and the next answer we're gonna get is six all right so that's the difference between static and non-static variables and you can use the um, static keyword with the uh, variables and blocks methods and nested classes so all is the same if it's a static method you can access that by just, just accessing the class if it's a non-static method if i get rid of this static method now and then you have to create an object to access this method all right so that was a quick tutorial about static keyword i will give you another example in the next video of static keyword in details so thanks for watching and if you have any question let me know in the comments below and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers. This is always back with another video of Java Central Training Series. So in this video, we will talk about this keyword. So there can be a lot of usage of Java, this keyword in Java. This is a reference variable that is referred to a current object. So I'm going to talk about the usage of this keyword in Java. So this keyword can be used to refer current class instance variable. This keyword can be used to invoke current class constructor. And this keyword can be used to invoke current class method as well. And this can be passed as an argument in the method call. And can be passed an argument in the constructor call. This keyword can also be used to return the current class instance. Okay, so now I think it's time for an example. So in this program, I'm going to create another class. So let's go and create a class, new Java class, and I'm going to name it student. Okay, press enter to create. So now we have created a class. So in this class, I will define a few variables. So let's say integer ID, and then I'll say string name, okay? And then we're going to make a constructor here. So the constructor name has to be the same name as the class name, right? So I will type student, all right? Oops, student, parentheses, all right? And then in the parentheses, I will declare another variable. So int id, comma, string, name. So these parameters are not the same as we defined before in the main class. All right, so here I'm going to add a code block, all right, and then let's say ID, okay, so now ID, this ID is basically this parameter, or this argument here, so as you can see that it highlighted that for us, so this ID is equal to ID, all right, name is equal to name, right, so this name and this name is the same, and this name and this name is the same right now because we are declaring in this constructor all right so let's come down here and let's print it out so i'm going to say wide display and then i'm going to add a code block okay and then s out 
and then I'm going to type ID plus name. Uh, we're going to add true quotation in the middle to make a space here. So add a concatenation here as well. All right, so now we have this class right now. Now let's go back to our main class, right? So I'm going to create a new object. As you know that this is not a static constructor. Uh, it's not a static class. So we have to create an object. So I will create student, all right? And then I will say, let's say student one, S1 is equal to new student type, let's say, uh, role ID one, comma, I'll type string value, which is I'm going to type my name. All right. And then semicolon at the end. And then student again, create another object as two is equal to new student. And then here pass the value two ID and then string that's type Tom, Tom, not top. All right. So down here, I'm going to display that. So to print that out, you can use S out as well, but I will use this one now. So S one dot display because we created here wide display. It's going to print this. That's why I'm using S display S one display. All right. And then down S two, display method right and now let's go and run the program so i'm going to click on this play icon and now i didn't get any value all right the reason why i didn't get any value is because that id is equal to this id which has nothing so to access these integers these ones right because they are the member of the class so i have to use a this keyword now so this dot id all right so it's already there and then i'm going to use this keyword dot name all right so now if i click here all right so now you know that these three things are highlighting now we are accessing this variable which is a string data type and name is a variable all right if i click on this one now this is so now let's go outside and then run the class again. Now we should get the result. All right, so this is the result now. All right, so as you can see that this keyword, basically it, it tells the compiler that I'm using that variable, okay? So another example is going to be program where this keyword is not required. So if a local variable and instance variable are different, there is no need to use this keyword like in this example. All right, so let's go back to our student class and let's change this to I and change this to N, okay? And now we don't have to use this keyword. All right, so I'm going to just get rid of this keyword first and then ID is equal to I and and right so now we know that there are different names so that's why we don't have to use this keyword now so let's go back outside all right and then here I will use the same objects here so let's run the program and now the answer should be the same all right so that is why we didn't have to use this keyword Maybe another example where you can invoke the current class constructor by using this keyword so this keyword constructor cloud so this constructor call can be used to invoke the current class constructor that's called constructor chaining this approach is better if you have many constructor in the class and want to reuse them so let me give you an example let's go to we are in the student class java class so i have a constructor here right let's create another default constructor so type student all right add a code block and then here I'm going to type S out and then I will type default constructor is invoked. All right, so we have the default constructor there and we have a, another constructor here which has this parameter, all right? So now uh, I'll go back to the main class Java and then I will run the program, okay? So we didn't get that value because it hasn't been used yet. If I want to use um, the same constructor where I have a default constructor in this class, 
So I can simply type this parenthesis semicolon. What it does is it is used to invoke current class constructor. So invoked current class constructor. Okay. And now let's go back to main class and then run the program. As you can see that we've got default constructor is invoked, which is this. And then we got another value because we're using the same default constructor again in the next constructor. All right. Okay. So there's another question here that where to use this constructor call. So this constructor call should be used to reuse the constructor in the constructor. It means the chain between the constructor. This keyword can be used to invoke current class method implicitly. You may invoke the method of the current class by using the this keyword. If you don't use the this keyword, compiler automatically adds this keyword while invoking the method. I think it's time for an example. So let's uh, start typing. I'm going to add a method here. So return type void and I'm going to name it M parenthesis add a code block all right so in that i'll try s out and i'll say method is invoked all right all right and now i'm going to add another method so void let's name it n all right and then i'm going to add a code block press enter first and then here i'm going to use that m method so how do i use it so this dot m okay parenthesis right and then i'm going to add a semicolon let's type a comment here so no need because compiler does it for me okay all right so down i'm going to add another method so let's say void I'm going to name it P, all right, and then what is that searching feature? Okay, add a code block, all right, and then in the code block, I'm going to use N, okay, all right. So now what it's doing is basically just add a comment. So compiler will add this to invoke N method as this dot N. All right, so let's type that so we know what's going on. Compiler will add this to invoke n method as this dot n. All right. Okay, so we have that now. And now let's go to the main class. All right. And then in the main class, I'm going to add an object. So we will create student all right and i'll say s1 is equal to new student okay we get ready an object called s1 and here i'm going to say s1 dot p okay and then run the code so it's gonna give us a message a method is invoked so you, did you get my point so what it's basically doing is let's go back to a student.java class and now look at the code. All right. So here in the method M, I've got this message and message is invoked. Let's go to the N method. This is using this uh, keyword to use that method. So it's going to add automatically for us. Okay. And then because we in this method, I'm using N method, which has this dot M, which is this method. So we got this message to print out on a console. Very simple. All right. This keyword can be used to invoke current class method. And uh, this keyword can be passed and as an argument in the method as well. All right. So I'll do a separate video because this video is a bit long now. And this keyword can be passed as an argument in a constructor call as well. So it's, it's not that hard. All right. So that was it about this um, keyword, guys. And if you have any question, uh, let me know in the comments below. You can follow me on Twitter at OASMIRZA01. And thanks for watching. If you find this information useful, please share. And I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers.
Hey guys, what's going on? This is Wise back with another video of Java Essential Training Series. So this video is going to be about inheritance in Java. Inheritance in Java is a mechanism in which one object acquires all the properties and behaviors of a parent object. The idea behind inheritance in Java is that you can create new classes that are built upon existing classes. When you inherit from an existing class, you can reuse method and field of a parent class. You can add new method and fields also. So why we use inheritance in Java? For two main reasons, for method overriding and for code reusability. So let's look at example, how can we make a subclass or inheritance from a class? All right, so I've got this main class here. I'm going to create a new class, right click on a package in IntelliJ IDEA, new Java class, and I'm going to make our class employee, all right? So E-M-P-L-O-Y-E-E. All right, so we have the class employee now in our project. So press enter. And now let's create a float a variable. So float, okay, I'm going to name it salary, all right, is equal to 40,000. All right, semicolon, and let's get out of the class. All right. So we're going to create a new class which is going to inherit it from this class, all right? So let's type a keyword class, okay? And the name of the class, what you're going to make, all right? So I'm going to say programmer. And then there's a new keyword extends. I'll explain that in a second, all right? And then the class name which you're inheriting from, so employee. EM employee. All right. And then add a code block with the curly braces. All right. So in that subclass, I will create another integer variable. I will type it bonus is equal to, let's say, 10,000. All right. Semicolon at the end. And now we have uh, two classes. This class is inherited from this class. All right. But let's go back to main.java here. I'm going to create an object. So let's type programmer. Well, it needs programmer and obj as um, object name is equal to new programmer. All right. So we have created an object now. Let's print it out. So s out and I'll say programmer salary is space and let's add columns get out from the quotation add a concatenation and then add object name dot salary all right okay so we got that and then s out and then say bonus of programmer all right and is add a concatenation obj dot bonus all right let's run the program then i will explain a little bit more so we have a programmer salary is 40000.0 bonus of a programmer is 10000 so in this example the programmer object can access the field of its own class as well as of employee class so that's called inheritance. All right. Uh, with that extend keyword, let me explain that to you. So the extend keyword indicates that you are making a new class that derives from an existing class. In the terminology of Java, class that is indicate inherited from uh, a call uh, inherited is called a superclass. The new class is called a subclass. All right. So the, how many types of inheritance in Java? Uh, on the basis of class, there can be three types of inheritance in Java, simple, multi-level, and heritual. So in Java programming, multiple and hybrid inheritance is supported through an interface only. How many types of inheritance is allowed in Java? Single line inheritance, multi-level, and heritual. So I'll give you uh, a quick explanation. What are they? So I'll use this Windows new feature screen sketch. Okay, so that's my screen sketch now. 
All right, so do I have a shapes here? Uh, don't actually solve, gotta use this pen tool. Okay, so single class inheritance, right? So let's say I have a class here called A, okay? And then this is inherited from class B, okay? So that is a single inheritance in Java, which is uh, and supported. So multi-level. Multi-level means, as you can see by the name, class one, class two, and class three, right? So you got class C, class B, and class A. So B was inherited from C, and A from inherited from B. So A can use all the operators and properties from class C and B as well. So heritage classes. So let's say I've got a class A here, okay? And then class B here. And then class C here. Sorry, C here. Okay, so A is inherited from B and C as well. So that's called heritual uh, inheritance. There can be three types of inheritance, single multi-level inheritance, right? So. There's another thing I want to say that inheritance is not supported in Java through classes. Okay, so what is a multiple uh, inheritance in Java? I'll give you another example. Let's get rid of it and start our screen sketch one more time. Okay, so the multiple inheritance is basically if you have class A here, okay, and class B here, and class C here. Okay, so A class is inherited from B, let's say it's C, make it easy, and that's B. And then B class inherited from C as well. So that's called a multiple inheritance. So A is inherited B. So that's going to give you a compiler error. It is not supported in Java through class okay. okay so i'm gonna give you an example of coding using uh, inheritance now so i've got this main class and main method here right let's go and create another class so right click here a new java class i'm going to name it calculation calculation all right and then in the calculation class just let's say define integer z okay and then define a method public wide and name the method addition addition all right so, and then pass the parameters int x and int y all right add a code block and say z is equal to x plus y all right and then s out and then say addition add a concatenation and print out z all right so we have one method here let's add another method okay so public wide let's say subtraction okay the same values int x comma int y all right and then go down here z is equal to x minus y done as out and say subtraction plus z all right so we have two methods in calculation class okay now let's make a subclass of calculation class so right click here new java class and let's name it my calculation all right so we have a new class now i'm going to extend that i'm going to inherit from calculation class all this data is going to be inherited into this class so how do we do that so public class my calculation and say extends is a keyword and then say calculation all right so we have done inheritance right and here in this class now let's add a method public right void and let's say multiplication yep multiplication okay and then same int x comma int y all right add a code block and z 
is equal to as you can see that all those variables are declared here in set are available in this class as well because that class has been inherited to my calculation.java now all right so let's say x multiply by y right as out multiplication okay and then add a concatenation add code all right so we have one method which does the multiplication for us but this is an extension of this calculation class which has all this data right so let's go back to our main class in the main method now i'm going to create an object so to create an object uh, i will i can use the scanner class to print out to us the numbers for addition subtraction and multiplication from the console but you guys know about it so i've already explained that so let's add a method sorry uh, create an object so I will say my calculation uh, come on where is it all right my calculation is and then create an object I will name it obj is equal to new is a keyword and then say my calculation and that's it all right so now this class can access to the uh, the, the all the data available in my calculation.java now all right because we have created an object so now let's say i will type obj dot and as you can see that now we got addition method multiplication method and subtraction method available to us all of them so as you can see that the multiplication a multiplication method is basically a bit darker than intelligy idea so that means it exists in the class where we're creating an object from. But subtraction is available to us. It's a bit gray because it's inherited from the class called calculation.java. So I'll use addition first, all right? So in the parameters, I can define integer two integer values. First one is going to be x, and second one is going to be y. So 10, comma, 10, all right? And let's run the program so that should be the answer should be 10 now sorry 20 10 plus 20 20 right my bad all right so same as addition method you can access uh, what is going on with my keyboard by the way I have no idea what's going on come on night do it shit I don't know what's going on with that keyboard but as you guys know that you guys can make another um, you can use the subtraction and multiplication option by using that obj object now all right guys so thanks for watching that was the tutorial about inheritance in java i hope you like it if you have any question let me know in the comments below you can follow me on twitter at awaitsmirza01 thanks for watching and i'm going to figure out what's going on with my keyboard now i can i can tie but once i press enter it does not go down what the hell all right whatever so thanks for watching talk to you guys in the next video cheers guys what's going on this is always back with another video of java essential training series so this video is going to be about access modifiers in java there are two types of access modifiers in java access modifiers and non-access modifiers the access modifiers in java specify accessibility or a scope of a data member method constructor or class there are four type of java access modifiers in java private default protected and public so we'll explain them one by one first let's look at the public modifier so i've got this main method and main class here i'm going to create a new class i'll type student all right, so we got the new class here, right? So here now, I will declare an integer variable. I will say id, okay, and then I will say string, and then I will say name. All right, okay. So we have two variables now. So if I go back to my main method, main class, sorry, so I can create a student. 
so I'll say SDU is equal to new and then student all right so I've created an object to use that class now so I can do SDU dot ID all right and I can uh, make integer value with that so is equal to let's say one is semicolon at them and SDU dot name that's a string variable is equal to so I'll type let's say YouTube okay and then we can print them out by using s out right so let's say I'll type stu dot id okay plus stu dot name all right so let's run the program all right so one YouTube right let me explain to you right now so these variables don't have any access modifier right now java will automatically add a default access modifier so if you don't have any access modifier it will be a default modifier will be added to these variable so let's apply a modifier now so i would say public all right and then i would say public here as well so now what public means is let me explain to you uh, give me a second Okay, so the public access modifier is accessible everywhere. It has the widest scope amongst all the modifier. All right. So with the public uh, modifier, you can uh, it can be accessed in class, in package, and outside the package by subclasses. All right, only. So outside the package, yes, it can be accessed outside the package as well. And uh, default. Okay, the default can be accessed in a class within a package and not outside the package by subclasses all right so only with the subclasses but without subclasses not in any outside package all right so outside package not available so private is within the class not in a package not outside the package not even by subclass and not outside uh, in outside the package so it's not available everywhere except within the class protected all right so protected is available in class within the package uh, outside the package by subclass only and not available outside the package all right so the public is available everywhere right so if i go back and run the program i'll get the answer one youtube okay all right so now let's look at uh, we have talked about default if you don't uh, declare any access modifier it will be default automatically and public is available everywhere all right so let's say I will change that to private all right and then I'll go back here I said private and now I'll go back to my main.java and try running the program now I'm gonna get the error so the error is uh, ID has a private access modifier in example.java.student so it is now private and available only for this student class so to access these variables now we have to use encapsulation we have to use setters and getters uh, method so I'll go to refractor and I'll click on encapsulation field and I will select both of these variables and let's say refractor so we got uh, public int ID get ID method it automatically made encapsulation for us so now let's go back to a java class and then i will can add let's say just get rid of this all right so now i can add stu set value method now stu dot set name okay so i set id so id i'll say one okay and then down here let's get rid of uh, this data and it says stu dot set name it's a string so i'll type youtube all right now let's run the program again and it's got nothing because we haven't printed out yet so i'll type s out all right and then i'll type stu dot okay just type id now stu dot get id and concatenation stu dot 
get name, right? And let's just print it out. As you can see that we got the answer now one YouTube. So while you use the protective, you need to use a getter and setter method. That's called encapsulation. I've already made a separate video for encapsulation. So if you want to know about encapsulation, uh, you can go watch that one. All right. So we talked about uh, private, public, and default. So what about the protected access modifier? So a protected access modifier is accessible within the package and outside the package, but through instance uh, inheritance only. That was a quick video of uh, access modifier. I hope you understood what does that mean. So thanks for watching and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. And don't forget to subscribe. Cheers guys, what's going on? This is Wise back with another video of Java Essential Training Series. So this video is going to be about final keyword in Java. The final keyword in Java is used to restrict the user. The final keyword can be used in many constant contexts such as variable, method, and class. The final keyword can be applied with the variable. A final variable that have no value, it is called a blank final variable or uninitialized final variable. It can be initialized in a constructor only. The blank final variable can be static also, which will be initialized in a static block only. All right, so now we'll give you an example with the final uh, keyword with the variables. So with that, I'm going to create a new class here. So I'm going to name it bike, okay, bike one. All right, so I've got a new class here. So in the int variable, I'm going to type final first int, okay, and then I'll say price is equal to $40, right? And then I will make a method wide and I'll say, let's say price, Let's say PR is equal. I've got to add parentheses, add a code block because that's a method. So we'll say S out. This is the price of the bike. Okay. And then I'm going to go back to my main class. And here I'm going to add a object. So bike, bike one. Okay. And then I can create uh, OBG as an object name, new bike one. All right. And then OBJ dot PR. Okay. Which is, uh, sorry, a price, right? So that's our variable here, the price. That's what we're going to access, right? So the price, okay, is equal to 50 semicolon, right? Now you can see that red line there. So if I hover over my cursor there, you can tell me that I cannot assign a value to a final variable because uh, you can only define a value to the final a variable at once, wherever it exists at first place, all right? Because it cannot be overridden, it cannot be changed. So that's how you can um, use the final keyword with variable. Now let's look at the, another example. I'm just going to get rid of this class, okay? And we're going to look at how to use that in a method. So let's get rid of this as well. With the method, let's create another class again. I shouldn't have deleted it, but that's all right. So class bike, uh, get, that's fine, B-I-K-E, all right. So here in the bike, I'll say final, okay, wide, and I'll say, let's say price, okay. And then add parentheses, add a code block. And then here I'm going to say S out. Okay. So this is the final price. Okay. And then that's it. Let's go back to our uh, main class. And then to override that method, what we can do now is create another class. Okay. And I will type, let's say, I'll say bike two by two, right? Here I'm going to create a method, right? So here we can create a method, um, let's say create another class basically. So to create a class, you can come down here and say uh, class, okay? And you can type bike two, 
okay and then extends bike all right and now if i hover my cursor it's telling me cannot resolve symbol bike all right so that's not the one so i have to use b i k e bike all right and then add a code block here and then say wide it's a price price method and then we're gonna add a parenthesis and add a code block and here if i hover my cursor it says price cannot override price in com dot example of java overridden method is final so as you can see that you cannot create another method which is being created already as a final method right so let's get rid of this class as well okay now we have got uh, this class. I just want to get rid of this class as well. There's so many classes, you probably get confusing. Okay, so we have two classes now. Let's look at the final keyword with the class now. So with the class, I'll go back to my bike class, all right? And then here, after the public, I'm just gonna get rid of this method as well. All right, and let's get rid of this as well. So I'm just going to type after public, which is access modifier to a final. All right, so come down here and I'll try making another class. I'll try and then I'll create a bike to extends. That's it. I'll say bike. All right, add a code block and then come down here. So already there's a red line here. As you can see that can I hire from final.com so you cannot even inherit from this because this is a final class with the final keyword right so that was uh, about the uh, final keyword thanks for watching guys if you have any questions let me know in the comments below and as always stay blessed and i'll talk to you guys in the next video cheers what's going on this is always back with another video of java central training series so this video is going to be about super keyword in java the super keyword in java is a reference variable that is used to refer immediate parent class object what is the usage of uh, super keyword in java super keyword is used to refer immediate parent class instant variable super keyword is used to invoke immediate parent class constructor and super is used to invoke immediate parent class method as well so let me give you a example without the super keyword and let's see what problem we face so i have this main class here i'm going to create another class so right click here new java class okay and here i'm going to name it let's say vehicle okay let's create the class all right, so in the code block, I'm going to type a uh, int variable and I'm going to name it speed is equal to 50 semicolon. All right. And then outside the class, I'm going to create another class now. Right click here, Java class, and then name it, let's say bike. Okay. All right. So in the bike class, I'm going to extend it to access that vehicle class so i'm going to get in inheritance from vehicle class so i'm going to use in extend and i would say vehicle okay all right so in that class now i'm going to declare a variable with the same name speed okay let's see if i spell that right okay speed all right oops all right so speed is equal to let's say 100 okay and then down here i'm going to create a method now so wide let's say display method okay and then add a code block here press enter and then here just print out speed okay speed all right so here what will what it's going to happen here is will print speed of the bike okay so that's a bike now okay and then we're gonna go back to our main.java and in that method I'm going to create an object so let's say I create an object from bike class and I will name it let's say obj is equal to new 
bike. All right, and then here I will try to display b dot display. Okay, semicolon, and now with that b, I will. Um, that's actually a problem, so I'm going to say obj dot display. Okay, and here I'm going to run the class now. And let's see what result do we get. It's taking a while. My computer is running a bit slow. I don't know why. I've got to figure out. All right. So we have the result of 100. All right. So in the by class, we did int speed is equal to 100. But this is um, getting inherited from a vehicle class where we have a same variable with the value of 50 but it's going to print 100 okay so let's look at the example of with super class now so with super class let's go to our vehicle and i've got this variable int speed is equal to 50 right and i'm going to go to by class now and we got the value of 100 right but here in the speed okay if i type super dot speed okay oops super dot speed so now let's see what result do we get all right so let's run the class now all right as you can see that we got 50 now all right so basically what's happened is like super is used to refer immediate parent class instance variable so if that is a pin class because that is getting inherited from this vehicle so if you use super it will use the pin class variable now all right all right guys that was a quick tutorial about super keyword um you can use that to invoke parent class constructor and methods as well so thanks for watching don't forget to subscribe and i'll talk to you guys in the next video cheers Hey guys, what's going on? This is always back with another video of Java Essential Training Series. So, we have done about 35 videos and in those videos I try to cover the basics of Java and a bit of uh, object-oriented concepts as well. And right now, I want to take a moment and I want to test those skills with you guys. So, I'll be making a couple more videos of the examples such as how do we uh, sort arrays and search in arrays and I'll give you a challenge as well so uh, this video is going to be an example of arrays how do we use them to make I'll be making a program such as uh, finding the tallest student in the class so that's being said let's get started hey guys if you want to make a program to find the average height for all students in the class to make the program more flexible we will ask the user to enter how many numbers of students in the class ahead of time and then use that value as a size of the array. After all students have been entered, we can use a loop to find the height of the tallest student and the average height of all the students in the class. So that's being said, let's get started. So the first of all, let's import a scanner class. So just press enter here so import java.util.scanner all right and then we're going to create a scanner object scanner i'm going to name it in is equal to new scanner and then system.in because i want the input from the console all right so we have created that now i need um, an integer variable the reason why it's going to be integer because the student number cannot be 0 0.5 or 0 0.8 uh, it cannot be half right so that's why the data type of the num student variable is going to be int so int num student all right and semicolon all right so now let's uh, declare an array so the data type of an array is going to be double and then the syntax of creating an array is while you type a data type and then square brackets and the name of the array object how oh, it's okay so now we got that now let's print out to the console or user that how many students in the class so i'll type s out and i'll ask the user how many students are 
in the class okay all right so the next step we're gonna do is we're going to ask the user to enter an input so to do that let's use that int variable is equal to in use that scanner object dot next dot int right so we got that as well now let's in uh, instantiate the array so i'm going to say height which is an array is equal to new okay let's make a space here to fix up the tabulation All right so new and then add a data type okay double and then say num students all right so now the the value of the heights the students uh, value of the heights is basically what of the number you type in on the console now i need a loop to go through each students and get the height for the students so i'm going to use the for loop so type for add parentheses and int i is equal to zero semicolon and then add a condition now so i less than i was going to say num students all right so the follow will be running until it reaches the number we typed in for the num students all right so add a semicolon again and then increment all right so i plus plus all right so down here add a code block here now and then printed a system right in the in the loop that enter actually yeah enter the heights all right and then i'm going to use an array object with square brackets and now i'm going to use i as an index for the array all right so next is equal to in dot next double right so it's gonna keep running it's gonna keep asking for the height and then index will start from zero okay all right so next we're gonna add another statement here let me just fix that okay so at this point we got the heights for every student in the class to get the, the tallest height in the class we need to use a loop now and then we will compare that height to rest of the heights we got all right so let's say for before the loop sorry i've got to I've got to declare a variable so double okay and then say max at height okay is equal to heights okay so i'm going to say zero okay remember arrays indexing start from zero okay so that's going to be the height i'll just declare that add a semicolon here and then use the for loop so for okay so since we have the height for max value the one indexing from zero so now i'm going to say int i is equal to one i'm going to start from the one this time semicolon and then add i less than height and then dot length so whatever the numbers we have in that variable okay in heights okay it's going to keep running for that okay it's going to go all the way and compare with all the numbers all the uh, heights we have in the array okay so let's increment that as well so i plus plus all right so to compare that with uh, with every numbers i have to a condition statement which is an if statement so i will say if max height is less than height okay let's say add square brackets and i then what it should do i've got another max height then so i'll type max height okay is equal to height in the array and i'll type one and then in the arrays add i okay because that's the integer uh, variable we're using to compare the values all right so so far we have the tallest height in the class now we need to print it out i just want to mention one thing here as you can see that in the if condition statement i didn't add a code block so on the if statement if you're just uh, declaring one statement then you don't need a code block okay but if you use the multiple statement you need a code block but anyway i will add that it doesn't really make a difference so let's get out from the for loop now so now what we want to do is add up all the heights 
so we can find the average of the heights so let's declare another variable now so I'll type double and I'll say total is equal to zero okay and then we're gonna use a for loop now so for I'm gonna say int i is equal to zero and then i less than height dot length and then increment that i plus plus okay let's finish that with that and then let's come down here add a code block and then here i'm going to say total and then add an array so every time i'm going to it every time it runs the program until the length of the height so you will add one it will add the next value to uh, to an array next I've added a system out dot print line and I've just in double quotation added the tallest students in a class plus a max height okay it's going to print out the max height and then we got system dot out dot print line f instead of uh, ln so I use the f modifier uh, which I can use that percentage sign 5.2 f so that's what I, I've already explained this in other videos so check that out if you want to learn about modifiers so comma instead of the plus total divided by numbers of students all right so here you might be asking that I'm dividing an integer uh, variable to basically that's going to be the integer value right so integer value to numbers of students so the number of students can be five point whatever so if you divide 5 by 2.6 or 2.8 whatever the decimal of value that's going to return a decimal value so that's why it doesn't really matter here okay so let's run the program now and i would say let's say how many students in the class i'll say six okay so let's say five eight two point three six point five seven four point two okay six point four Right, so now I've got the result the tallest students in the class is 8.0 which is right okay it's here all right and then the average of that is 5.40 okay so our program is working 100% so guys uh, that was it about arrays uh, I just wanted to give you guys an example so what you can do with arrays and loop and you can combine them to make a cool programs like this one and if you have any question, let me know in the comments below. You can follow me on Twitter at awaysmirza01. Thanks for watching and don't forget to subscribe and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Chase. Guys, what's going on? This is Awais back with another video of Java Essential Training Series. So this video is going to be about multi-dimensional array. I've actually done a video of single uh, dimensional array, but this video is going to be multi-dimensional array. So what is a multi-dimensional array? So uh, let's say you've got, uh, let's say 10 values in an array, okay? But in those values, if you want to add a sub values in those array, you can do that. That's called multi-dimensional array. So Java support the use of multi-dimensional array using the same sort of math syntax that you use with simple arrays. Uh, but instead of using a single pair of brackets, you need to add two pair of brackets. And that will tell uh, Java that I'm making a multi-dimensional array. So let's look at the example and, um, and I will explain that. Okay, so first of all, for array, I need to define uh, what kind of array am I making? Is it a string, integer, or double, float, whatever it is. So I'll be uh, making a string. So I'll type string data type and then add two pairs of brackets, okay, instead of one pair of brackets. Okay, so if you want to make, uh, let's say you could add a three pair of bracket as well, that's going to be three dimensional array. But if you're adding a two pairs of bracket, that means you're adding a two dimensional array. So I will give you an example as well later, but let's look at this, all right? So I will type the name of the array. So let's say I will say states, okay? And then is equal to new, which is a keyword, and data type again, all right? So I press enter, as you can see that IntelliJ IDEA automatically added two square brackets for us because it's not that we're creating a two dimensional array because it's a two pairs of brackets now. Let's add a semicolon. And when you declare a new and then data type of an array, you need to define how many uh, values you are storing in that array, like indexing the array, okay? So I would say I'm storing two values which is the outer values, okay? 
so in every value I want to store another two values okay so the indexing start from a, a zero for the array so let's look at an example how to use them now so I'll use the name of the array which is states and add two square brackets okay which is a string array now okay so the first we're gonna type zero because we start the indexing for array start from zero and then I'll say a sub item for zero index I need to type zero okay and then is equal to I'll type let's say Victoria okay and then go to the next line use the states which is an array name and then two square brackets and now because we have two sub values in that array which is a zero index value for outer array and then this is a sub value of that array so I have to type zero okay and then one and then I'm going to say is equal to it's a string, string array so let's start in double quotation let's say in Melbourne okay um, and then get out of that quotation semicolon all right so far we have used our array okay so we have two arrays in that state so we have to uh, declare another way so instead of writing that I'm going to copy and paste copy this and then paste it alright okay so now <clears throat> I'm going to say uh, this index is one because we already used the uh, two subclasses for zero and now I'm going to use a uh, two subclasses for one okay alright so now let's change the values as well so let's say new South Wales okay and then let's say the capital is Sydney okay all right so I've used our array now so to print out those values I'm going to use a for loop now so for parentheses and declare an integer i is equal to zero semicolon and let's say i less than states dot length method I've explained the length method but just uh, briefly it is basically it's going to see that i is equal to zero as long as the condition is i less than states number which is which we have array and dot length so how many index we have in that array and then when you come back it increment that so plus plus all right and then let's go down to the line now we need we forgot the semicolon that's a syntax error so guys make sure that you don't make any syntax errors which are not very hard to find all right let's add a code block now all right so in the code block I can say if you want to make your program simple I can use s out okay I'll show you that another uh, method as well in a second but let's look at this now so I'll say the capital of okay and then add a concatenation and then say states okay and then say singles uh, square bracket and another square bracket so here I'll say 0 and 0 which is going to use uh, this value alright so the capital of Victoria and I'm going to add a concatenation and let's say add a string value which is going to be is okay and then let's go to the next line add a concatenation operator which is a plus operator and then say states okay and then two square brackets and then here you'll say zero and one so Melbourne okay so zero and one all right and then let's add the uh, decimal point and then so add concatenation operator add double codes and let's type a uh, point here all right let's print it out let's run it so we have uh, the capital of Victoria is Melbourne the capital of Victoria is Melbourne all right so I'm going to say here I plus plus all right let's run this or oh, semicolon let's run this time now so now I should say the capital of Victoria is Melbourne all right so now we have that okay uh, to make uh, this program a bit more uh, uh, let's say advanced so we can do 
uh, we can build we can use a string builder okay it's an it's a, it's a part of the java.lang so I'll type string ring builder okay and I will create a SP and object for that is equal to new string builder all right so next add a semicolon and then what is a string builder basically if you hover over the cursor here and press control Q in IntelliJ idea which gives you a documentation of string builder you can read through it so just want to mention here the principle of on the string builder are append and insert methods so I'm going to use append method in this example okay so what it does basically the append method always add these characters at the end of the builder okay so let's look at it so now I will use SB okay which is an object name for string builder dot append okay so I will append I'll say the capital of and then I will get out from that statement and then come down to next line and I will add a decimal point and then append again and I'll say states oops st states okay and then add two square brackets and I will say I okay and zero so right now when Kambala comes to I it sees that I is equal to zero okay so we have a zero value here and then zero as a sub item all right so next we will go to another line and I'll say append okay and then I'll add is let's add space here as well and then let's go to the next line dot append okay and then I'll say states okay and then single uh, square brackets square brackets and I'll say I okay so right now still I is z zero because I is zero here so compiler comes to this line sees that I and zero so zero zero that's going to be Victoria okay that's going to be this value and then I'll type zero here as well okay all right so now let's go to the next line add our decimal point dot append and then decimal point all right so we have completed our statement next let's print that out so system that open line SB that's an object name all right so now let's run the program so now it should say the capital of Victoria is Victoria and the capital of New South Wales is New South Wales all right the reason why it's saying that because I zero zero which is fine Victoria but here when it comes down here it says zero and zero again so that's why it goes Victoria is Victoria so here we have to type one instead of zero let's run the program again Victoria is Melbourne the suit the capital of New South Wales is Sydney all right so that's how it works the compiler comes here print this line and then comes here it says that I is equal to zero all right and then zero which is at this one and we're using the straight which is an array name all right all right guys so that was about the multi-dimensional array uh, I want to mention here that this is a two-dimensional array right now okay but you could make a three-dimensional array as well so it's going to be very complicated for a beginner programmers if you make a three-dimensional array basically what it's going to do is let's add another square bracket here all right so we need to add another square bracket here as well all right so here I can say that this outer array contains two sub values which is two all right and then this sub values contains the value of two as well so that's a bit of complete uh, this is very complicated so I mean you never have to go uh, to the three dimensional array but it is there you could make like 10 dimensional array or 15 dimensional array if you want so I would say two uh, the outer array two values which is zero zero has two subclasses and then these subclasses has another two values in those subclasses all right so uh, Java support that as well you could make three dimensional array if you want but uh, I will make an example video of that later in the course but for now uh, that's it for this video guys thanks for watching and if you have any questions let me know in the comments below and I'll talk to you guys in the next video going on this is always back with another video of Java essential training series so this video is going to be about a real list you might have noticed that so far all the arrays had primitive data types stored in them well there's a reason for that array can only hold primitive data type 
and we need a way to store objects in the same way. There is why ArrayList can really help. Another benefit of ArrayList is that you could increase and decrease the size of Array dynamically. It's not a fixed size. So in this program, I have main class and the main method, right? So first I'm going to declare a list. So the list interface is a member of a package java.util. When I select it, I get an import statement on the top. So let's press enter. And as you can see on the top, you get the list import statement from java.util. Each of these collection objects include list and maps. It can contain as many items you want, but it's good practice to declare what type of item they're going to contain. And you do that with something called generic notation. So type that. That's called a diamond operator. So you declare the type of the item you're going to add to the list. And I'm going to type strings. So strings, each item within the collection must be an instance of class. If you want to contain integers, you would declare integers, the helper class for int, not the int primitive itself. Now I will give the object name and I will name it list. So space, let's say list is equal to keyword new and then here, but then instead of declaring list as a constructor, I will use implemented class or a concrete implementation of the class and that will be a real list. All right, so now let's talk about the syntax. All right, I'm going to add a semicolon here. So the first one I selected a real list, I got an import statement on the top of my code. This is also a member of java.util. So to use the class, you should import. Next, notice again that I'm using a constructor method for a list class, not for the list interface. While it's possible to create an instance of an interface, you will have to completely implement all of its code. And if you want to use a list object that builds into a Java framework, use ArrayList. And the ArrayList contain an ordered collection of data. You could think of it as a resizable array. When you declare an ArrayList, you can declare it with a constructor with no value and then the array list will grow as needed. Or if you already know how many items you're going to add to the list, you can pass in an integer value and that will result in more efficient allocation of the memory. I'm going to leave this to an open number of items. Also notice that you don't have to pass data type of the item again. This was something that was introduced in Java 7. Prior to Java 7, you would have to add a declaration of the data type again. But it was redundant, so in Java 7, you can simply say, use the same declaration as I did before. Add some items to the list, all right? So here I will type list decimal point. I get all the methods available here, add, size, add all, clear. So we'll talk about them in a minute. Use the add method, all right? And here I need to pass in a string value. So add double quotation. I will say Australia, let's say Australia, and then list dot add again, and pass in a string value again. So Victoria list dot add, and then say Melbourne. All right, all right. So now we're going to print that out to the console. To do that, I'm going to simply call out as out print line and I'll call it list. I'll run the program now and I'll explain that in a second. All right, so once I run the program, I get this message, Australia, Victoria, and Melbourne. So then I see the data list is in order in which I declared. Now, when I pass the list object into a print line, I'm actually calling the two string method of that object. And that method output a pair of brackets and the value separated with commas. I'll describe later how to use your own iteration code to loop through the data in your own. Update the list now. So I'm going to come down here and let's add another item to the list. So list.add and this time I'll call it Sydney. All right. And then let's print it out. So list, let's run the program. All right, as you can see that we have updated the list now, okay? So now let's look at the method, how to remove 
any item from the array by using its index number so how do we do that so let's start list right dot remove method so it's going to remove from an index number any integer all right so let's use that okay and then as you guys know that the array listing our index starts from zero instead of one okay so that's zero one two and three we have three all right so let's say i want to remove uh australia from the list okay so i'll type zero and then semicolon and now let's print out the list again as out out hold it list and let's run the program and the third time as you can see that the australia has been removed okay and the next matter we're gonna look at is how to uh, get a item or list of item from the array uh, by its index number so let's try string okay because that's a string value so we'll just string let's say city is equal to list dot get method all right so we're going to use the get method now so we have one two three four okay uh, sorry zero one two and three indexing start from zero always remember that let me get uh, on one okay that's going to be victoria uh we forgot the semicolon here and let's print it out all right so s out and i'll say the second city is and let's add the concatenation and let's type city all right so let's run the program again all right so as you can see that the second city is melbourne okay i'm using the first one as you guys know that we have removed the list from almost uh, we have removed australia uh, from the list if i get rid of this statement all right and now i will run the program so now we're gonna get a victoria all right so we got that victoria now let's see uh how to use the index of method in the list all right so let's use uh let's look at our integer variables i will name it pos is equal to list dot index of all right so index of i will say find me sydney okay so you can find out and it's going to compare it to the uh, compare this string value to all the items in the list all right then it's gonna tell me where is it so let's put the semicolon here and then let's print it out so i will say sydney is at position and let's get out of the quotation and then i would say pos that's a variable for that let's run the program and let's find out where is sydney at what position so sydney is position three so we know that one two three four so if i remove australia so let's say list dot remove and then i'll say zero okay and let's run the program again okay and now sydney is at position two because we have removed australia so these were a few methods and a ray list uh it's pretty good and um, that's it for this video guys and the next video is going to be about sorting arrays and then we'll talk about how to search through arrays all right so thanks for watching if you have any questions let me know in the comments below and as always don't forget to subscribe and i'll talk to you guys in the next video cheers what's going on this is always back with another video of java essential training series so in this video i'll be talking about polyformism in java so polyformism in java is a concept by which we can perform a single action by different ways polyformism is derived from two greek words poly and morph the word poly means many and morph means forms so polyformism means many forms there are two types of polyformism in Java, 
compile time poly uh, polyformism and runtime polyformism. We can perform polyformism in Java by method overloading and method overriding. So we're going to look at an example now. Uh, I'm going to use a Windows, um, a new feature. It's called Sketchpad. All right, so here I'm going to give you an example. So there is an example of polyformism. You probably used it without even thinking about it. So let's look at this plus sign. What is this? Okay. In many language, well, it depends. All right. So let's say we are adding two variables, A and B. Okay. So if A is an int value, sorry, my writing is pretty bad because I'm using a mouse. So let's say it's an int. Okay. So what will happen? It will add these two variables. So it will add two integers, right? So let's say we have the same variables here, okay? A and plus B. So let's say now this A and this B variable is string. I don't wanna write all the string, but I'm just telling you this is a string, okay? So what will happen? The concatenation will happen this time, right? So it will add two strings with that plus operator. So polyformism is basically, it automatically detects the behavior of those variables and perform a task for us. So this behavior or method is built into a lot of languages, but we can use the same idea and concept in our own classes and our own objects. So here an example. So I'm going to erase this page and let's say I define a bank account class. So bank account class, okay. For financial application. So this bank class basically determines that it has a behaviors, account balance, a name of the owner, a withdrawal limit. So there's a lot of behaviors of this bank class, right? So we're going to create a few more classes here. So there's one class here, second here, third class here. So let's say it's a checking account class. So I'll just type C K A and then we have a savings account class. Oh, it's very hard to write. Okay. And then we have an investment account class. So I'll just say I N V E S. All right, so now let's say the share, they extend from the bank class, okay? So because we're doing that, so they will share information such as uh, account balance, savings, all right, investment, they could withdraw, they could check the account details, the owner name, right? So let's say saving accounts has another attribute which has interest rate, so interest rate whatever okay and now it gets a bit more complex so let's say if you withdraw uh, some money from your investment account right and the bank rule says that you're gonna get a penalty because without 30 days notice you cannot withdraw from the investment account so this class will have a bit more complex behavior and then that withdraw behavior was defined in this bank class. So I'm already inheriting it from the bank class, right? But I can define a more specialized version just for the investment class. And that would call uh, overriding the method of this super class. Uh, just types, this is a super class. All right, so that would call uh, overriding a method because this bank class has a withdrawal method already, but we have a different kind of uh, behavior because we cannot withdraw without 30 day notice. So I have to write another special withdrawal method for this investment that would override the bank class over a uh, withdrawal method. So that's called overriding the method. I'm inheriting from the bank class and I have my own method for the investment class. So I can use that one when it's useful and I can use the bank class method when that's useful. So the polyformism lets us work with objects created in any of these classes. So I could now have an array of accounts with 10,000 of these different objects loaded into it. 
and I know that I can call the withdraw method on any of any one of them without knowing exactly what class it was initiated from. So it would do the correct behavior for each one just as using the plus sign would automatically switch between addition and concatenation. So it's flexible. Polyformism lets us do the right thing at the right time. When learning object-oriented programming language, polyformism is the concept that I heard a lot of people say that technically I understand it, but I just don't know where to use it. Well, that's okay. Most of your classes won't need it. We don't have to go look for polyformism situations. They occur naturally and understanding the basic idea is enough for us to move forward. Now, I'm going to give you an example. Just want to talk about what is the upcasting. So when the reference variable of a parent class refers to an object of a child class, it is known as upcasting. Now let's look at the example, okay? So for that example, I'm going to create a class named bank. So let's create a class bank. All right, so we have a bank class now. Here I will declare and integer and I'll call it get well get interest rate okay so I'll say get interest rate all right that's the method now all right so next we're going to say return in a code block I'm going to say return um, let's say well let's say zero percent okay because this is the main class of our bank all right so and then next create another class and let's name it um a and z because it's australian uh, bank so i'll call it a and z and then here i'm going to declare int and then get interest n-t-r-e-s-t rate all right and then come down, add a code block, and then here we'll say return, and I'll give you value, let's say, 3%. All right, and then create another class now. And let's say, I will say ComBank. Okay, that's another Bank of Australia, so I'll use that. So here, let's create another int method and say get interest rate all right and then add a code block and here we'll return for the interest rate for the comeback is pretty high so i would say 12. okay so we have four classes in our program right now but i want to create another class so because the example i gave you before it has three classes so let's say another class for nab that's another bank of australia and then we'll say int method name would be get int rest rate interest rate add a code block again and then here we'll return let's say if they're pretty good so i'd say five percent all right so we have three bank classes now each bank return a different interest rate and now we're going to go back to our bank class well let's go to the main class here in the main class now, I will create an object from the bank class. All right. One thing I didn't do is that in the X, sorry, I didn't inherit it from the bank class. So I want to make these three classes a child classes of this bank class, which is going to be a super class. So let's go back to ANZ class and let's say extends bank. All right and then change that here as well because we're going to inherit so extend let's say bank all right so these three classes would be a child class of a bank class now so here extends all right and then now sorry bank all right so we have these three subclasses of the bank class let's go to our main class now and here i would say Let's create an object. So I'll use the bank class to create an object and I will name it, let's say, A and Z, all right? And then is equal to, I'll say a new keyword 
and here I will use because I'm creating a object from the bank class but because the these three classes now are a subclass of the bank class so I can use these three classes directly okay so I will say a and Z that's it all right so let's create another object and I'll say com bank is equal to new I would say com bank so com bank all right so bank nab oops I misspelled it so nab change the name is equal to new nab all right so now as you can see that I'm creating an object from a bank class but these three classes are subclasses for this bank class now so I can use the method and I can use those classes directly from the bank class now all right and then let's go down and print down something all right so I would say that's out just and then I would say a n z interest rate is and then let's add the concatenation operator and I will say a and z dot get interest rate all right so as you can see that I can access the get interest rate method which exists in the subclass of the bank class and the class name is a and z I can access that right there okay so that is kind of concept of polyformism all right so I'll give you an example of polyformism when I'm doing an overridden method in the next video so stay tuned for that as well so now I can just copy and paste this couple of times and then let's say change the values here and I'll say com bank com bank while well, I'm keep writing bank and then here change that to com bank all right here let's change that to nab so nab and I can change here nab as well all right so let's run the program now and we should get over return values as the interest said what we defined all right so we have a and z interest rate is 3 com interest rate is 12 and 5 let's go check it out so we have 3 12 and 5 all right so that was a quick example and i try to explain at my best of polyformism so f f like finally i want to say that it's a concept it's a it's a concept so don't really worry about it right we'll talk about it more when i um, do a overriding method video or uh, probably the next one so stay tuned for that guys and if you have any question let me know in the comments below as always you can follow me on twitter at oasemusa01 thanks for watching again and i'll talk to you guys in the next video cheers hey guys what's going on this is always back with another video of java central training series so in the last video i've explained to you guys what is polyformism and what are the concepts to explain what is method of writing so we're gonna look at the example then i will explain that to you guys all right so the first thing what we're going to do here is i'm going to click on packages all right and then create a few classes so let's create a class name let's say bike okay and then we're going to create another class called bike2 so let's say bike2 okay so now we have two classes and a main class so let's go to the bike class and then here in this class let's say i will make a method here so i'll just type void I would say run all right and then add a code block okay add a code block here and I will say uh, bike one so as out and then say bike bike speed is and uh, let's say 60 kilometers per hour all right well we can define a variable as well so I'll type bike is equal to 60 semicolon and then here I can use concatenation to display my bike speed so let's say bike all right so we have one variable which has an integer data type all right and then we have the method name run in bike uh, 
bike.java all right so let's go to uh i'm gonna copy this code okay and i'm going to paste it here all right so i'm going to paste that here all right so one thing we're gonna do here is that we're gonna make this class a subclass of the bike class all right so here you type extends bike all right so now this is a super class and that's a subclass right and then in that uh, bike 2 which is uh, having all the method and variables available to this class so I can change the let's say 70 all right so now I have a uh, same method name run okay and I have both method name so if I go back to my main.java and here I will say I will type <clears throat> let's say I'll use a subclass so bike 2 okay and I will say obj is equal to new and then I will use bike 2 okay all right so now let's say if I print out the run method if I call the run method right so let's say obj dot run okay so can you guys give it a guess that is it going to print out 60 uh, the bike speed is 60 60 or it's going to print out the bike speed is 70 okay this is a subclass and this is a super class all right which has the same method all right so if I go and run the program very simple concept all right so if I run the program now it's just taking it a bit longer as you can see that it's printing bike speed is 70 instead of printing bike speed is 60 here all right so it is called a method overriding well java compiler basically look for the recent statement so the recent method we did is this one right because that is we calling uh bike 2 all right and then the the first method we have is a uh, run method which belongs to this class and then it will go and look for the method available in the bike.java class so that's why it will print out uh, this class okay so basically that's a subclass and that's a bike class so that was a quick tutorial about a method of writing and if you have any question let me know in the comments below it's very simple you just go look for the first method of uh, the class you're calling all right so it's very simple guys all right thanks for watching and if you have any question let me know in the comments below and you can follow me on Twitter at awaysmirza01. Thanks for watching again and I'll talk to you guys in the next video. Guys, what's going on? This is Always back with another video of Java Essential Training Series. So before we talk about, I was gonna make AppSec classes and interface video, but I wanna just um, show you guys what is the instance of operator in Java. It's a quick video, so let's see what is it. So the Java instance of operator is used to test whether the object is an instance of a specific type, such as class, subclass, or interface. If you're not familiar with interface, don't worry, we'll talk about it later in the course, all right? So the instance of in Java is also known as a type comparison operator because it compares the instance with type. It returns either true or false if we apply the instance of operator with any variable that has a null value it will returns false so I think it's a time for an example so I'm going to declare a class here so right click here Java class and let's say I'll name it animal okay so in this class I'm going to create another class so let's start class and name it dog okay and then which extends so extends animal all right so now we have one class animal here and we have another class which is a subclass of animal class because we're using extend operator here okay so now let's go back to main class okay so to use the instance of operator I'm going to create an object so I'll say let's say dog okay and I'll say obj object name okay new dog all right now let's print out the result so I will say obj okay instance of animal 
so it should return the true as a result now because let's run the program or as you can see that it returned true guys so that was a quick example of uh, instance of operator so if you have any question about it let me know in the comments below and that's it for this video guys and i'll talk to you guys in the next video and don't forget to subscribe and thanks for watching it bye Hey, what's going on everybody? My name is Awais and I welcome you to another video of Java Central Training Series. So in the last couple of videos, I was talking about the polyformism concepts such as uh, runtime polyformism, encapsulation, and this video is going to be about abstract classes. So what are the abstract classes? Uh, later in the video, I'll give you guys an example as well. First, let me, tell, let me explain to you what is an abstract class. So, abstraction is a process of hiding the implementation detail and showing only the functionality to the user, okay? So, a class that is declared with abstract keyword is known as abstract class in Java. It can have abstract and non-abstract method as well. Don't worry if you don't get it, I'll give you an example in a second, okay? So another way it shows only important things to the user and hides the internal details. For example, when you send an email, right, you just type your content and then just click on a send button, which will send that email, but it doesn't show you the process of how it does. All right. So that's is basically abstraction. Let me give you another example. Uh, let's say okay let me give you another uh, email ex uh, example again okay so for example when you consider the case of email complex details such as what happens soon you send an email the protocol your email server uses are hidden from the user so therefore to send an email you must need you just need to type the content mention the address of the receiver and then click send likewise in object oriented programming Abstraction is the process of hiding implementation details from the user. Okay, so a class which contains the abstract keyword, it is known as abstract class. So let me give you an example, okay? This video is going to be a bit long, but be patient, but we're gonna discuss this abstract uh, in details. All right, so let me declare a class. So abstract, okay, and I'll type class, and then I will, I could uh, type the access modifier as well, but don't worry about it now. So I would say, let's say wide, okay. No, sorry, not wide. I'm not making a method, but okay. And then let's say uh, print info, okay. And then we add a code block. So that's an abstract class, okay. Let me give you an example of abstract method. So if I go inside and I'll say wide, sorry, abstract, wide, get info. Okay, so that's going to be an abstract method. Okay, so class start with abstract word is an abstract class. Method start with abstract word is a keyword. It's an abstract method. Okay. So abstract classes may or may not contain abstract method, which I've shown you. There could be another method without an abstract keyword. I would say get info one, and then we can add a code block to it, and then I print out whatever we want to print out. Hello, YouTube. Okay, so abstract class can have abstract and uh, non-abstract methods. All right next step but if a class have at least one ma abstract method then the class must be declared as abstract so let's say this is a class print info right if we have abstract method right if I get rid of this and I'll just say public okay then it gives me an error let's read the error so class print info must either be declared abstract or implement abstract method Okay, that's why we need to declare the class as abstract because we have one abstract method in the class. Uh, let's go to the next step. 
So if a class is declared abstract, it cannot be instantiated. Instantiated, actually, my pronunciation for this word is pretty bad. So instantiated. Okay, what does that mean? Let me give you an example. Let's uh, make this class abstract. Okay, and then we have the print info, right? And we have one method. Okay, so let me just get rid of this method as well. Uh, so we have print info class, which is an abstract class, and we have a wide method. Okay, get info one method. Can I make an object and use that object in my main class? So let's have a look. All right, so if I type print info and obj is the object name, new keyword, and let's say print info. Oops, there is an error. Select the method to override slash implement. Okay. Well, you can make this, but I don't want to go through with this because there are a lot of methods here. So let's cancel it and let's just get rid of this code block. And then we're just going to use our uh, general method declaring uh, syntax. OK, so now we use this class, create an object and a new and a class. Let's read that right. Print info is abstract, cannot be instantiated, so we cannot directly access the method inside this class or variables inside this class, we cannot access anything which ha which is in this class. So that means instantiation, instantiation, okay? All right, now let's go to the next step. To use an abstract class, you have to inherit it from another class, provide implementation to the abstract method in it. All right, let me give you an example. So now, if I want to use this class I need to make a subclass of this class. So let's do that. All right, so I will type class and I will name it, let's say, print, uh, get print info, okay? Get print info. All right, and let's do this. And then now we're gonna get inherited. We can, we can extend this to print info one. All right, so now we can uh, we're inheriting from this class. So now if I go here and I'll type get getInfo, oops, it's okay. And now I'm going to type get here as well. It's going to make an error. Okay. So now in that main class now, because this abstract class is, uh, is inherited in here. So now I can use this class and create an object and access everything available in that abstract class, which is a print info. Okay, so let's say I would say uh, obj dot, and I'm going to call that method get info one, which is here. Okay, so if we run the program, it should say hello world now. Come on, my computer is a bit slow. Yep, hello YouTube. Okay, so again, we cannot access this class. This information is hidden to the user now. Let's say this is a user, we are the main class, and this abstract class is hidden now, okay? You can't access it. To access it, you need to use the other class, which is a subclass of this class now, all right? We have covered that topic now. Next step, if you inherit an abstract class, you have to provide implementation to all abstract method in it. Let's say I will change this to abstract, okay? And I am getting an error. Now, if a method is an abstract method, okay? So abstract method cannot have a body, all right? You cannot provide any body to it. You cannot add variable, you cannot add if, you can't add anything to it. So I've got to get rid of this code and I've got to get rid of this code block. Okay, add a parenthesis and semicolon. All right, now it should remove the error. So now we need to uh, use that method here now, okay? So we need to apply a body of that class here. So I can use, let's say, I would say, uh, wide okay get info one okay and then add a method 
and then come down next block of code and I'll say as out and say hello YouTube okay so basically that method exists here but we're going to apply a body or add a body into this subclass which is extended from this class okay so we have covered a few things about abstract class now but now what I'm going to do is basically I'm going to write a big program okay so it's going to be very long if I keep explaining the program as well but don't worry I won't use anything new in the program I will only use whatever we have covered in the course so uh, I'm just going to fast forward the video and I'll write the program and then once it's done and then explain that and I will, we will look at the abstract class and I hope that it will explain to you guys a bit more in details all right so let's go all right guys so I've made another class called employee okay it's an abstract class all right and then we have the class name employee here I have the private string name address number so now the class is an abstract class right so if I go back to my main.java I'm just going to get rid of uh, stuff here okay so because that's the abstract class okay so what I do now I will just try to access that class now so employee obj is equal to new employee okay again Again, I've got an error that should I override it or implement that, okay? What I'm gonna not, I'm not gonna do that. So I'll just get rid of this code block. This is because IntelliJ idea does a lot of stuff for us. So that's why it give us that error and recommendation. So hold that over, hover over your cursor to the employee. So this is an abstract class cannot be instantiated, all right? To access this class, what we have to do now is basically create another class let's say a salary class okay so I'm gonna create another class which is going to be extend from employee and here I'm going to write down a bit of code uh, and then I'll just tell you that by here first of all let me show you extend employee all right so I've done uh, writing my program here basically this is a class extend from employee class okay so now in the salary subclass everything is available what we have written in employee class all right so i'm gonna go back to my main.java and now instead of using employee class i'm just going to create a salary class so salary all right and then here change the employee to all right so now if uh, i hover over here in the parentheses i can see that salary and salary cannot be applied to expected so i'm, I'm expecting string string and number uh, which is an integer data type and double right so uh, that's the another error so let me just finish that so I'll type my name uh, I'll say comma and uh, programmer programmer okay comma and then it's in the integer so I'll say ID one and then my salary let's say 80 point this okay all right so now I don't see any error so as you guys can see that now I can access uh, employee class by accessing salary class all right because it's a subclass so that's inheritance and that's called abstraction okay so this data is not visible to the user now okay it's hidden so the only way we can access that by salary class now so that was a, a tutorial about abstraction guys and um, I tried my best to explain it to you guys but still, if you have any question, uh, let me know in the comments below. And you can follow me on Twitter and ask me direct question over there. Uh, thanks for watching again and talk to you guys in the next video. Next video is going to be about inheritance. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, what's going on? This is always back with another video of Java Central Training Series. So this video, we're going to talk about interface. So what are the interface in Java programming language? Okay. So an interface is a reference type in Java. It is similar to a class. It is a collection of abstract method. A class implements an interface, thereby inheriting the abstract method uh, of the interface. Okay. So what does that mean? We have the class here, a main and a main method here. So let me show you how you can make an interface in IntelliJ IDEA and then we will go through with it what are the uh, things we're going to talk about interface all right so right click here 
new Java class here, you can change that to interface, okay? And then name it, let's say, A. So now we have interface A. So the keyword interface, before the name of the class or interface, if you type interface, that's going to be an interface, okay? All right. Along with the abstract methods, an interface may also contain constraints, default methods, static methods, and nested types. Method bodies exist only uh, for default method and static methods. Okay, so let's create a void and I'll name it B. Okay, and then void, let's say, uh, oops, I made the mistake, C and void D. All right, so we have three methods, right? These are abstract methods because I just said that before. That is a collection of abstract method, but it can contain default methods, static method, and nested type as well. But the method, uh, the method bodies exist only for default methods and static methods. Okay, so let's say this is an abstract method now. Okay, we don't have to type abstract method. So if I type abstract here, it's gonna get grayed out. So modifier abstract is redundant for interface method. So you don't have to type abstract because we already know, the Java already know, this is an abstract method because it's in the interface. Okay, all right, so if I try to type a body of it, so S out, hello YouTube, it is going to give me an error. Let's hover over the cursor, so not allowed in interface. So interface, either they can have uh, uh, methods, abstract methods, or if you want to type a body, the method has to be static or default, okay? So, let's look at that now. So, let me just get rid of this and this as well. All right, so these are all the abstract methods. And then if you want to type a body in it, so you need to make it static, static, okay? And then, now if I hover on my cursor, static method interface should have a body, okay? So, get rid of the semicolon, come down, add a add block, and then S, S out and it say hello YouTube okay so now it's not gonna give us error so we need to have a default or static method to have a body in interface all right oops. okay let's get rid of this body now and we're gonna get rid of this static word and then add a semicolon all right so let's go to the next up when writing an interface is similar to writing a class but a class describes the attributes and behaviors of an object. And an interface contains behaviors that a class implements, okay? Well, I will explain that with example in a second. Well, as long as, uh, okay, let's go to the next step. An interface is similar to class, okay, in several ways, okay? So, an interface can contain any number of methods. As we can see that we have three methods here. An interface is written in a file with a .java extension. On the top, you can say a.java, that's a file extension there. Okay, the bytecode of an interface appears in .class file. So, we have .class file, what we're going to create, let's say, I need to implement that interface into a class. I'll talk about that, okay? Just uh, give me a second, okay. So, interfaces appears in packages and their corresponding bytecode file must be directory structure that matches the package name, okay? So, however, an interface is different from class in several ways. So what are the things that are different than class in interface, okay? So you cannot instantiate a method, or sorry, instantiate an interface. Let's go to our main class, and if I want to uh, instantiate that, so we have that wide method B, right? So if I wanna, if I try making, uh, let's say, A, and I will say, uh, let's say OBJ is equal to new, and I will say B. All right, so now let's have a look. What is that? Can I resolve the symbol? Let me like look at the method name B. Okay, we're going to change that to A, actually. My bad. Okay. All right, so now, oops, we have don't have to okay let's get rid of this code this is getting a bit annoying okay so now if I hover uh, a is abstract cannot be instantiated all right as you can see that next 
all the methods in an interface are abstract so these methods are abstract because uh, we can't instantiate them okay in the main class or any other class we have to implement that interface and then we can access those methods so all methods are abstract in interface so an interface cannot contain instance fields the only field that can appear in interface must be declared with both and study that's what i've shown you before an interface is not extended by a class it is implemented by a class okay we'll look at that we'll look at that in a second as well so an interface can extend multiple inter uh, interfaces as well so let me just get rid of that all right let's just fix up the tabulation here so let's go and new java and i'll try b here and let's say interface and then here i will say interface b extends a all right so we can have we it can extend uh the other interface as well let me get rid of that for now okay all right so next how to declare an interface that's what i'm showing you public interface name code block and the methods in it all right so next interface have the following properties now okay so interface is important implicitly abstract you do not need to use an abstract method keyword while declaring an interface okay so we did not have to let's say abstract right and now it's going to give us error that abstract is redundant for interface because it's already an abstract okay next methods in interface are implicitly public okay so if they are public methods okay but we cannot access them directly all right so next uh now i'm going to give you an example basically okay so we have the main class there we have interface a here okay so let's uh add some uh let's add another class here and then we will ex implement this interface to that class okay so right click java class let's have it fun okay and now i'm going to use the keyword implement a okay all right so now come down here now it's giving us error let's have a look at that so class fun must be either declared abstract or implement abstract method so we need to have all the methods available in the interface to get it worked properly because we're implementing a now all right so now let's say public void and i would say b all right come down here and then add s out let's say hello youtube please subscribe okay let's go down now and then add the second method public wide c all right let's add a code block and then s out and then say hello um, i hope you enjoying java course all right let's get out from here public wide and then d all right add a code block and then s out let's say this is is a interface video tutorial okay so now once i've declared uh, every ver uh, method available in interface now the error gone away okay so we can use the methods now okay and now i can go back to my uh, main class all right and then i will create an object so fun okay obj is equal to new fun that's done and let's use the obj and i'll call dot so we have three methods available here b c d okay but say b it is going to print out hello youtube please subscribe let's look at it okay all right hello youtube please subscribe okay now you might be thinking that why use an interface what are the benefits for interface an interface is a contract of what the classes can do when a class implements a certain interface it provides 
implementation to all the abstract method declared in the interface. Interface defines a set of common behaviors. The classes implements the interface, agree to these behaviors and provide their own implementation to the behavior. This allow you to program at the interface instead of the actual implementation. One of the main uses of interface is to provide a communication contract between two objects. If you know a class implements an interface, then you know that the class contains concrete implementation of the method declared in that interface, and you are guaranteed to be able to invoke this method safely. In other words, two objects can communicate based on a contract defined in the interface instead of their specific implementation. So that was a quick tutorial about interface and I tried my best to explain to you the concept of interface. A difference between interface and abstract app class is not much difference. But if you still have any question, let me know in the uh, comments below. You can follow me on Twitter as well. Uh, you can ask me questions there. Um, I just want to mention here that if you didn't get the concept, don't worry. I'll be starting a project based tutorials on Java. Um, in, in really soon so stay tuned with the channel and uh, don't forget to subscribe thanks for watching guys and i'll talk to you guys in the next video cheers hey guys what's going on this is always back with another video of java central training series so i've done a separate video about abstract classes and interface but i wanted to make a quick video and showing the difference between abstract class and interface. So what's the difference? Abstract class and interface are both used to achieve abstraction, where we can declare abstract methods, abstract class and interface both cannot be instantiated, right? So you can see on the screen what are the difference between abstract and interface. So I'll just go through uh, step by step. We got six differences, all right? So I'll try to explain them as well. So abstract class can have abstract methods and non-abstract methods. So if you have an abstract class, you, you can declare a method with abstract keyword uh, and without abstract keyword, which makes it non-abstract, right? In other side, interface can have only abstract methods. Abstract class doesn't support multiple inheritance, but interface support multiple inheritance, which means that you can create one inheritance and then another one, another one, and you can extend those inheritance and you can use methods or anything belongs to that main inheritance you can inherit from another inheritance so third difference is abstract class can have final non-final static method and non-static uh, variables as well inheritance has only static and final variables right so if you want to declare a variable or you want to declare a method it can only be declared by using static keyword and final keyword the fourth difference is abstract class can have static methods, main method, and constructors. All right, so interface can't have static methods, main method, or constructors. So the fifth difference is abstract class can provide the implementation of interface, but interface cannot provide the implementation of abstract class. All right, the abstract keyword is used to declare abstract class. The interface keyword is used to declare interface class so these are the basic difference between abstract class and interface and that's it for this video guys that was a quick video about difference between abstract and interface and um that's it so don't forget to subscribe and if, if you have any question let me know in the comments below thanks for watching and i'll talk to you guys in the next video hey guys what's going on this is always back with another video of java central training series so in this video we will talk about recursion in java so recursion in Java is a process in which a method calls itself continuously. A method in Java that calls itself is called a recursive method. It makes some code compact but complex to understand. So the syntax for uh, creating uh, recursion in Java is basically a return type and a uh, method name and then you call the method again. All right. So let me give you a quick example. So that's like infinite times recursion in Java. So we have a main class here. I'm going to create another class. So right click here, Java class, and I'll name it, let's say, recursion, okay? Click okay. All right, so we have the class here, and I'm going to create a method in this class. So let's say static, void, and I'll call it, let's say, a, add a code block, 
Uh, it's in the cold blood simple I'll type hello okay and then I will call that method down here okay so now I've called that method inside its own method so that's basically called a recursion if you hover over here uh, cursor so that it's telling you that it's a recursive call okay so that's uh, basically a recursion so let's go back to our main class now and in the main class, uh, if I call that method now, so let's say a method, so it's telling me that dot com dot example, I need to import that, so I will press alt enter, so it will do that for me. So now if I run the program, it's going to keep calling that method, okay, it's a infinity, so it's going to give me an error at the end, so it's a recursion, all error. So now uh, we've seen that, so we we can see that now uh, infinite recursion it's happening so let's have a look at the example of finiting times okay so what I do I'll go back to my I'm just gonna get rid of this and let's go back to recursion.java here let's get rid of this as well so in a static method right uh, I will increment that so let's go and declare a variable first so I'll declare a static variable int okay and I'll name it this count is equal to zero okay and then let's go into the method now so in the method I'm going to say count I'm gonna increment that plus plus okay and then I'll say uh, if count less than equal to let's say 10 okay and then what it should do come down here and then say print out hello and let's say uh, plus is a concatenation operator and then print count okay and then let's call the method itself so let's get out from the if statement and then let's say a okay so that's a recursive now so now I'm, tell, I'm telling this method that just keep counting keep incrementing until it reaches 10 okay so let's go to the main class now here we will simply call that method now so a done and then let's run the program now it's going to so hello one two three four five six seven eight ten so there may be a question in your mind that why use java recursion there are certain problems that just make sense to solve via java recursion this is the case because sometimes when solving problem recursively you can really cut down on code with your solution so for example let's take a look at something called Fibonacci sequence all right here the example let me write that in in comments here so what is it so 0 comma 1 comma 1 comma 2 comma 3 comma 5 comma 8 comma 13 and so on okay so if you don't know about this uh, sequence let me explain to you so the third number of the sum of number one and two which is going to be zero plus one it's going to be one and then one plus one is equal to two which is here so two plus one three which is here and then three plus two five which is here and five plus three is eight here so that's called uh, Fibonacci sequence okay so we have uh, we know what is uh, uh, Fibonacci sequences now here's a big question how do you solve this problem with recursion in Java there are really only two things any recursion code needs to ensure that it will work properly a defined ending point a constant progression towards the ending point so as long as you abide by these two rules you will be okay if you fail to abide them you might get caught in an infinite loop what I've just shown you before and you might have to terminate your program manually. Well, what's the defined ending point for our Fabaconi sequence? Okay, I keep calling it Fabaconi, but it is Fibonacci sequence. Okay, well, it will come in the form of the problem you wish to solve. The question would be something like this. What is the 40th number of Fibonacci sequence? So there you have it that 40th number in the ending point of our sequence okay so okay so what's our constant progression towards that point it will be that we'll need to iterate through our recursion 40 times one by one 
there's a measurable way of ensuring that we are moving towards the ultimate goal right now with this in mind let's think about what's the code would look like the first thing we need to do is think of how Fibonacci sequence can be represented in terms of an equation so I'm going to write that in a comments here so let's say f n is equal to f I'll use the capital F n minus 1 okay and then plus f n minus 2 okay so that's the equation of Fibonacci sequence so now we know what is a Fibonacci sequence as an equation which makes sense right so the n in the case represent the index of any particular number in a sequence now obviously we can't just plug it in the value of 40 for n and know what the answer is because we need to start back at the beginning and work our way up to n to figure it out so since we need to work our way from beginning of the equation then that means we'll likely need to start there with our coding so your code will start like this so i'm going to start writing a code now so we have our main class and a main method so in the main method let's uh, add some variables okay so int n1 is equal to zero int n2 is equal to one okay and then let's print it out so i'll say n1 minus add quotation so add a concatenation plus n1 okay and then use our Fibonacci I keep saying it's Fibonacci but it's Fibonacci sequence C Q U E N C E and then let's say n1 and true okay don't worry it's uh, an error because we haven't declared a Fibonacci sequence a method yet so I'll show you in a second okay so let's get out of our main method now here we'll use uh, we'll start another method so public static void and Fibonacci sequence all right so here we say n int1 and 1 int and 2 okay let's go down now and then we'll system out uh, let's say in the bar in the quotation n2 let's get out of the quotation and then say plus n2 okay just forgot to type minus here so that's been pretty good at start but there is no recursion going on here Remember, we need to call the Fabricone sequence method inside of itsal to start a Java recursion. The only problem is if we do this now, it will run forever. Remember two rules. First, we need to uh, clear progression towards endpoint, and two, we need an endpoint. So on the top here, okay, so I'm going to declare a private static int index, sorry, int index is equal to zero. So we have a starting point which is index zero and then ending point should be int let's say stopping point i will call it stop stopping point is equal to 40. okay All right so we have two uh, variables now starting and ending point okay so now we have established the starting point and ending point but not the recursion so let's put that as well okay so all right so i'm going to add recursion to our code and i will finish the program and once it's done i will explain to you guys all right so Okay, so our program is finished uh, I'm going to explain that quickly so we have our main class we have two variables index starting point which is 0 and stopping point which is 40 we have a main method I've declared two variables here n1 and n2 the first statement I'm printing out is index 
index. I, I think I should run the program and it, that would be easy for you guys to understand what's going on here. All right, so we have index zero, zero, which is this statement because right now index is zero and n1 is zero as well. And then we use the Fabriconi Fibonacci sequence n1 and n2, which has the parameters here, okay? But the main thing to understand here is basically this method. We're printing out index, index, n2, okay? So that's this statement. So n2, one, and index is zero. Right now, index is zero. So if index is equal to stopping point, then should break the program, should return, okay? Otherwise, increment the index. So it's keep getting incremented here. As you can see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven here. And then we use the Fabriconi Fibonacci sequence here, okay? So I'm saying that n2, okay? comma the second parameter is going to be n1 plus n2 okay so we're getting one value to add it to next so that's a fibonacci sequence so 2 2 plus 3 5 5 plus 8 13 and then so on okay so the main thing to notice here that this is the method fibonacci sequence and i'm calling the same method inside its own method so that's the recursion guys and um, if you still have any questions about it, let me know in the comments below. You can follow me on Twitter at AwaySmith01. Thanks for watching again. And don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching. Talk to you guys in the next video. Cheers.